Alrighty, hello all, welcome once again to another episode of Watchpoint. Big news this week in the world of Overwatch, E-League, TSM, Fnatic, and of course a huge patch in Meta Shift. I'm ZP, joined by Slasher and Opled, and how are you guys doing today? I am doing great. Uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff to talk about. I mean, things are moving forward pretty fast, which is which is nice <laughs> to see after you know all this, all these online tournaments. <laughs> I am just ready for today's show to talk about how much I love New Divas Defense Matrix style. I think it's brought a whole new dimension to competitive Overwatch. Uh, and a bunch of other meta shifts have just been fantastic to experience firsthand in the last few days. Guys, don't you agree? I mean, anytime I fight a diva one on one right now, I am filled with joy as her defensive matrix just comes mm -hmm. up over mm -hmm. and over again. And it, Hallelujah. it it's supposed to have a reserve it. somewhere in there, but I, I don't know I where think the you guys are doing it wrong. Like you're not playing diva, you know? No, I mean, but exactly. But, He's right. Are you playing diva <laughs> against diva, ZP? Because you're not, it doesn't no, seem like I, you're doing it right. I, Slasher, I am the other type of scumbag. I am playing McCree because not only is McCree really obscenely strong this patch, he also seemingly gets more MMR than other characters. So uh, I've been grinding my way up, trying to hit There's 80. There's nothing wrong with McCree, okay? The game <laughs> needed another long-range sniper. Uh, now the Widow is gone. Uh, this fits it in perfectly, can shoot six times in a row, and do the same amount of damage. I think it's fantastic. I am just over the moon. You didn't even mention I, I, Zenyatta, you know? Zenyatta's, I mean, he's really, really good right now, but he hasn't bugged me as much as the McCree and uh, the... Because even he side. can't do anything against D.Va when she's discorded. He still gets yeah. destroyed. <laughs> all right. Look, this is, we, we love all this stuff so much yep. that we're going to talk about how much how great it is just a little later. Yeah. Well... Uh, so going on to results here this week, of course, our week brings a whole bunch of different tournaments uh, coming up, of course, or in the last week, of course, uh, for the Nexus Cup for uh, competition in the Asian region. Uh, MIG Frost uh, wins again, and uh, they've been playing pretty well. I know, uh, Rod, you had uh, some extra thoughts on them. Uh, you watched uh, all that pretty intently. Yeah, Nexus Cup was really cool to see. It was the first major tournament in Asia to have the Korean teams playing against the Chinese teams. Korea has had a few tournaments uh, over there with the OGN Invitational and a few other things. And previously we saw uh, LW, Luxury Watch, be kind of like the best Korean team up until maybe for the first months of closed beta and then first release of the game along with UW Artists and UW Quicks. But very recently, uh, Woon, famous League of Legends player in Korea, has started uh, a new Overwatch squad, which is actually two teams, the sister teams, that play against each other, and they already have climbed the ranks to be pretty much the best team in Asia for the most part. And they played Artisan in the finals. Uh, most recently, it was two Korean teams in the finals. China did not make it there, I think, which is indicative Vic's of Korea. Third, right? This is China. Yes, yeah, yes, they did. Uh, but gaming, yeah. MIG took it out, took it home. Pretty, pretty. Yeah, yeah but they were undefeated easy. the whole event, right? They made it through the upper bracket, and they made that in the grand finals, and they're looking really good. I think we talked about it maybe two weeks ago, or I was saying to how much that they've been practicing and how good they're getting, and I think it is really evident in the Asian community and competitive scene that we've seen so far for them be able to jump over teams like LW, Artisan, and Quicks and become this best team. And it's a good omen, too, for the Asian team when you stop and think about it because you look at, of course, uh, the different teams that are involved. But once you have one team that's a juggernaut in the scene, it helps every other team catch up to some degree as well. So if one team is doing stuff really, really well, way above the norm, people do look at their direct competition. They try and catch up. And if one team has gone that far ahead, it means that the rest of the pack shouldn't be too far behind. So that's just good for that scene in general. Of course... Moving on, we in the NA side of things, we had the I Buy Power Cup where Envious right, uh, was able to take uh, the qualifier 3 1 over C9, and Code 7 was able to win it out over LG. Of course, Code 7 now TSM. Uh, interesting stuff coming out there where Envy, of course, continuing their dominance and Code 7 uh, on the upswing, and probably no surprise that TSM ended up signing them. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty predictable results based off what we've seen recently, you know, in other online events. So. Uh, I don't. I don't think there's much exciting to say about it. You know, Cloud9 taking a map up Envious, great. You know, that's better than the last couple of times, right? <laughs> I mean, it's really just the continued Envious show where they are going to win. The storyline is anyone going to not just beat them but come close? The answer 
is still no. And then you might see some shifts after the big patch this week. Yeah, that's, that's going to shake things up. Like it's going to be uh, interesting. But NBA should be in position to continue dominance, right? Like they're playing in the team house. They have the most dedication, maybe, right? So I don't know. We'll based see. on the based on the patch, I feel like Envious gets hit a little bit because uh, their fair play was really, really powering them. But they ha- they have so many good players that can sort of swap off. I think they're not going to be hit that hard, and they'll still be number one. Code Seven, I think, or now a TSM gets boosted up a lot because I was never really impressed by their projectile play. Period. I don't think it was really Nicholas and Torx for a. But now that uh, the meta is way more. Uh, shifted towards things like McCree and Hitscan in general, I think it's going to be a huge boom to TSM. And conversely, I think it's going to be just an absolutely terrible patch for LG because even though Gods is really, really good at Hitscan, Enigma has good Hitscan, chops all the rest, historically they have not been as strong of a team when Hitscan is the name of the game. And right now it feels like Hitscan is absolutely the name of the game with the changes that came in the last patch. Now, Code 7 has been playing real well. I, I still give the nod to Cloud9 as probably the second best team, even though I think... A whole bunch of mix of teams are now fighting behind Envy, and it's actually really close to call between uh, Cloud9, the new TSM, now the new Fnatic. Uh, you have NG Red, you have Liquid, and everyone's kind of close to each other. And right now, it's kind of all battle between those five teams. Maybe one other that um, I'm not mentioning right now. And then everyone's fighting to catch up to Envy, at least in North America. So to me, nothing really surprising at all. Uh, was this the event where where um, Code 7 got stopped on Dorado? Or was that like the week prior? Uh, Code 7 so got... No, that was the uh, was beat invitation where they got yeah, uh, yes. blown up. Yeah. Well, the meta shift is really going to change a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, I think and whoever... Go- some teams might be able to figure out Anna better first and maybe have an yeah. advantage, right? You know, it's like it's going to be... There's going to be some stuff like that before teams really figure things out, I think, because... I think there's more opportunity to like swap comps up with with like the supports that are available now, where maybe we we don't see things settle that quickly. I guess. I kind of wonder with Anna, and uh, we'll see where things go here. But I know it, she has very unique opportunities available to her in comp that like in actual organized comp games that she doesn't really have to her in pubs. But the one thing I nope just playing with and around Anna in the pub format right now is that her overall healing impact power feels like less than should be. It's more the sense that, like, you look at Lucio, who's AoE healing everyone for a bajillion every second. I kind of wonder, it's like, going forward, uh, Farana, is the answer going to be maybe on a gang buffed for pub use at some point, or perhaps just uh, the other supports getting taken down a little bit for just overall ridiculousness? Hold on in your balance talk, ZP. I'll hold, okay, hold, we'll hold come on. to <laughs> it later. <laughs> uh, I do want to say... Even though we moved on to the, from the previous topic, I kind of want to bring it back for a little bit because it came up to me. I want to ask you guys, um, what do you, how much impact do you think Korea and China is going to have now that we Overwatch and esports continuing to have a little more hype? A little birdie was saying that the new the stuff that's going to be coming for Asia seems to be rather large or whatever is going to be yeah. forthcoming in terms of league stuff, and maybe it's going to be OGN, which seems to be the logical showings for Korea, China, who knows? But you know they have a lot of stuff over there that they're doing. I mean, like, um, what do you mean in terms of impact? Because, like, I think as an eSport, it's already more popular in Korea and Asia than it is, like, over here, right? Like, Overwatch well, they, is very popular in NA in Europe, but it, as an eSport, it's not at that point yet? The, well, there, there are three three aspects that I, I want to hone in on. And this, I, I know we've kind of skipped this, but this is much more interesting to me than talking about North American online tournaments for the 107th <laughs> time. They're all the same. None of them really matters. None of them matters to the land. Uh, and fun, funny enough, this Nexus Cup was on LAN. So Asia already doing it better than NA and EU and esports. Not so surprising so far. Uh, the first thing is we have seen Overwatch kind of take over League of Legends for PC Bangs in Korea. For China, it hasn't taken over League, I don't think. And I think Crossfire is still ahead of Overwatch. But Overwatch is still, like, pretty, pretty high up there. Uh, how much of an impact do you think the game will have within their own country and region compared to the other games in esports. And that's like a really tough question to answer because it's like there's so many other factors governing it, right? Like League of Legends is still free to play and Overwatch is not. So is that going to limit like the spread of Overwatch into households in Korea? You know, like is that going to limit its growth potential even if it is really popular now? So I think that's going to be like long term that that's going to be something that is really going to be questioned. But I mean, in terms of esports impact in Korea, I mean, I think that you know, players are already, 
mean, people people already accept that it's basically going to be you know something as as professional as league. I feel like, but obviously it's hard to say. I'm not I'm not there. You know, I don't I don't know. Um, well, the one thing I'd say is, uh, do we actually know how much Overwatch costs in those other regions? I know, of course, uh, if you're playing at PC Cafe, you don't have to have a license on your account. You just use the PC Cafe's license. And there's all sorts of different ways of obtaining Overwatch in the Asian areas as opposed to in the U.S., where the only way you play Overwatch is pending your $40 at a minimum. So I, I feel like the accessibility thing probably isn't as bad, but I don't actually know what it takes to have a copy of Overwatch in, the, in say, China, for example. I believe the pricing is pretty similar to how it is here, and I kind of tried to okay. standardize that for all regions. But I think more than anything, the PC bank play is the most indicative thing that we could tell about those regions right. and countries because of how strong of a user base they have for that type of play where people are used to going to PC banks over there and, and playing from there. And for Overwatch to be so big on, especially in Korea and rising in China, I think shows a pretty... Um, it looks looking pretty good. I think we're gonna have to see another month or two out how this kind of progresses. But I definitely think, especially in the Korean region, being ahead of League of Legends is a huge indicator to the rest of the industry over there in terms of like how much things are going to grow. And of course, we haven't heard from Blizzard yet on what they're gonna have, what impact they're gonna have. We have I mean, we're talking about E League a little bit later and, and such. That's gonna be interesting like, thing because like from our perspective, we're all wondering like, are these Korean teams gonna come in and dominate us? But it's like when is there going to be a competition that's going to, you know, bridge the Pacific gap, right? So, uh, my, so then my second question to you ties into both these things. It is, the first part is these teams, MIG Frost, UW Artisan, um, UW, UW Quicks, Luxury Wash, and then you have the Chinese teams like IG Fire and Newbie, NGA Club, Snake, Snake Esports. <clears throat> in terms of just them playing and how they've looked in their videos and how they looked in their matches, do these teams have any shot against the top tier teams in NA in EU right now? Right now, my gut feeling, and I haven't watched as much of it as say you have, Rob, but my gut feeling on watching it and all the rest is that I feel like the teams actually have very, very good coordination, but mechanically they're almost playing a different game in the sense that they're not as mechanical, mechanically lethal as their North American and EU counterparts. So as a result, you see weird things where fights just drag on longer than they should. And in general, you compare it to, say, NA and EU play, I feel like if they were to go against, say, Envious, they would probably just get out DM'd right now is where I sort of feel things I are. I think I tend to agree with that. I mean, I think that MIG Frost is at, like, a little higher level mechanically than the other teams are competing against right now. Just based off, like, I mean, I've only seen, you know, like, three different matches from them playing, so it's it's a very small sample, but, I mean, they, they kind of impressed me a little bit, so I think that they might be able to do okay, but I still think that, as you said, like, the NA and EU teams would have the advantage right now. Yeah, I kind of tend to agree here. When I talked to Wung a few weeks ago about how they scrim and how they think about the game, he says that he believes most of the Asian teams playing Overwatch look at the game because of what kind of games they play right now. First as a MOBA with FPS elements, where Western teams look at the game like an FPS with MOBA elements. So I think things like coordination, especially on alt usage, is great for the Asian scene. They're also, I think, pretty good in terms of picking. I think they're a little bit behind on the meta, especially because of hit scan characters, which are preferred more in NAEU, and that kind of make things uh, a little bit different. But at least in terms of how the Asian teams are picking uh, their teams, they are focusing a lot on how they're going to use all the O's together and how they're going to conserve them and how they're going to make it work off of that, maybe not necessarily getting picks and, yeah. you know, I mean, that, that works very well, but it only gets you so far when you just get headshot by McCree, you know, like twice across the map, right? <laughs> well, so. it's also not just... I was going to say, it's also not just mechanics. I also, and this is a weird thing, and the it's the most I can say is that's developed from playing FPS games for a long period of time, the sense I'm even referring to this, but beyond just mechanically hitting shot after shot and beyond just overall team coordination, the other thing where I feel like the Asian region seems to be a little bit far behind on is game sense. Just the game sense of, let's put it this way, when you watch Tailspin, Tailspin knows exactly when that there's an opening in the game and he can go in and push it right to the limit without dying and get two, three pickoffs. It's sort of one of those things where it the decision-making is born from just playing a lot of similar FPS games over time, and that's there. I don't necessarily think, just look at the decision-making of the uh, Asian region, that they have that killer instinct just yet. And it is a little bit different than mechanics where you can definitely train hit scan aim. It takes a little bit longer to train that sort of killer instinct game sense as well. Yeah, uh, so that actually... It's funny to me because, like, when I watched a lot of the CS players transition, I think that they lack that 
killer instinct because they hadn't played like the deathmatch games where you want yeah. to take these calculated risks more often because they can pay off big. And I mean, I, I think that, you know, does play into that different mindset that Rod was talking about, about, you know, the MOBA versus like the FPS mindset. I think that's interesting in terms of having those two styles and um, in terms of like a clash of styles, you know, depending on what the metagame is, at, where the metagame is at, you know, maybe one style is better than the other or something. But, you know, eventually I think you'll see a convergence. And I think that more NA and EU teams will have to, I guess, adopt more MOBA style concepts some, in some ways in terms of like how they handle teamwork and stuff. And it'll be interesting, I think, if that might happen when more teams are getting team houses and coaching, because I think that you'll see talent from League of Legends kind of come in at that level to help some of these uh, these Overwatch teams, you know, develop and reach like the next stage of development once they're at you know a more professional level when we have all these big events. So that'll well, be interesting. We, we, we've seen that killer instinct from Korean League of Legends teams and Chinese Dota teams. They definitely yeah. have it in them to execute the same type of style and play that they've shown in dominance in both of those games for long periods of time, years in the making and i think transferred that over to overwatch it doesn't seem like that long of a stretch and things like mechanics and aim and tracking and a lot of things with hit scan characters and projectile characters i mean that's what comes down to practice and they're the best at that especially in the conditions that they have and the low ping that they have and how close to each other and the talent pool over there and the amount of players they have um i think it's a pretty bright future so the last point i was going to make and just as you two were talking about is how long until we have teams like SK Telecom and KT Rolster that is picking up MI, you know, maybe the MIG team, buying them out, or the Artisan or Quicks or LW team. Uh, we have IG and Newbie both in already for the Chinese team. But and all the Chinese more... big orgs are already in, basically. Well, or not LG teams. LGD to me is the kind of the top tier one that I'm looking at the most. And I, IG would be the other one in there already in. So how long? Do you guys get want to hear a guess now? How long until SKT, KT come in? How long before the OGN League is announced for several I mean, hundred thousand I dollars? Think, I think both of those things are kind of tied together. Like we've seen this week with the E League announcement, some of these organizations already knew that this was like in the works, right? And that's yeah. one reason why we're probably yeah. seeing Fnatic and Team Solo Mid announce their teams this week. So, you know, I think when, when that happens, you'll probably see a lot of those big Korean orgs jump in, and that's probably going to be very soon. Right. Yeah, I mean, right now, nothing will really surprise me in Overwatch in terms of how quickly things develop. But it's just it's at warp speed right now. I I have stories I can say on air, some I can't. But I will just say that in general, the amount of things where I've gotten asked, to, hey, can you come to this at last second where tournaments will literally come up out of nowhere? It, that's the one thing is that everything's going so quickly. I sometimes worried that I hope every event has good and proper plan behind it because a lot of the events we've had recently have just come up like very spur of the moment, last minute, where everyone's trying to get in now, 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 now. And for most part, it's been working out. But man, it it worries me a little bit with how quickly it's going because normally so, you think to other to other games, you have a longer lead up time where events are getting planned for months and months. Whereas for Overwatch, I feel like events are getting planned for maybe like. A few weeks, and they say, "Okay, we just gotta go with it. It's time sensitive." I mean, are you like making a dig at E League here? Like, I no, mean, no, today, not, like not, tomorrow. Not e -League. Tomorrow is the qualifier, the start of the qualifier. I, there, there is a <laughs> little bit. It would have been nice to have a little bit more lead time there for that to be sure. But I, I just, I'm not really hitting on anything because I feel like it's everything to some extent. It's, uh, you know, the ESL qualifiers came about very, very quickly. Uh, the, uh, some of the tournaments we have, like the Beyond the Summit Cup, came up, you know, got announced and then came up very quickly. Like everything feels like you get the announcement, and then suddenly, less than a week later, it's here. It's not just an E League thing. It's not just a every. Every org, I feel like, has done this to some extent. It just, everyone's just trying to get in immediately, for for better or for worse. I think we kind of need Blizzard to be the one that creates some structure here. Um, you know, whether that's with their own league, their own events, or you know, a circuit style point system like they have for the other events, which I would probably hate if they did that. But you know, it at least provides something for StarCraft and the other games, right? So. I mean, I think that that point will probably come pretty soon, but uh, I guess we're not there yet. <laughs> well, that was all for me for, for Asia, but I'm pretty excited now that we've had Nexus mm -hmm. Cup finish. Um, I'm going to guess, I guess three months. No longer than three yeah. months will we have SKT, KT, and the OGN League. I'd almost say sooner if I had to bet. I, yeah, you know what? Probably. Probably a month or two. <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, the, the real bet is when do you think that the Korean team will be the best team in the world? <laughs> you know? uh, I, uh, I thought I know. a year and a half, and then I am quickly lowering like the amount of time every single time that I, I was asked. So I thought more, more recently a year. I think that seems safe to me. So you don't think they'll, oh. they'd win BlizzCon this year, but like no. BlizzCon next year would be Korea? Yeah. So that's yeah. kind of like what the League of Legends timeline was like, right? Like they kind of got stuck here later. Yeah. Then NA and EU and League, but then the second year they were dominant forever. All right. Well, of course, this brings us to our next uh, topic here, where, they, where we were talking about uh, Asia Realm uh, results, then NA results. Uh, of course, ESL qualifiers uh, moving on. A lot of your teams that haven't qualified did get in. Uh, on the EU side of things, of course, Pretz, Too Strong, finally getting in. They've been dark horses in the EU scene for a while, so no surprise they got in. Bikini, Beach Esports, Deathmatch Gang sort of coming up and showing themselves. Uh, North American side, Colorado Clutch, Selfless, One Shot, uh, all getting in. But there is one notable exception where FaZe had an Ono. Oh <laughs> as in they an lost oh the no. team Ono oh in the <laughs> round of 32, a team that admittedly it does have some veterans of the game not veterans of comp on it but for a name like phase for the pedigree that phase is supposed to have that's a disaster what in the world is going on there i mean if you look at the roster of players they play with too like they've been swapping around a couple guys yeah so that's kind of hurt them some but they still brought in like too easy who has experience you know winning some tournaments in overwatch and they brought in blam who is not you know he's he's been on good teams like good teams he's a veteran player it's like, what is going on here, you know? I mean, it's 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 kind of crazy. You know, FaZe has been a, a complete mess. I mean, throughout <clears throat> the announcement and them playing in tournaments and then just trying to get things together has not gone well at all. And it is most evident when they've been playing these ESL qualifiers of how things have gone poorly. I think we got a first glimpse of what might happen back at the Josh OG Invitational. And now most recently we've seen that thing, not a whole lot um, has changed over there. I think it's a kind of a complex issue right now. One, the team was put together with all of, and I'll actually make a comparison a little bit later, but the team was put together with the only, the free agents available at the time, Mendo being no longer with IDDQD, uh, Clamp not having, not been, playing with a team, uh, Wonderful is kind of a new talent, not playing in a team, Fraud initially, um, this is his first foray into Overwatch, Veinless was no longer playing on Experiment, and Evoke, which was playing with Veinless on Experiment, also was no longer playing. So they were all put together in this, you know, in this fashion because they were the free agents available. So I will say this, I've heard from insider sources here just talking with other teams, all the rest. I do think I know what the problem has been with FaZe. And it comes down to the fact that you have a lot of teams right now that get signed that don't have any real structure or oversight. The organization will sign an org and then say, good luck, have at it. Uh, and notably with FaZe, the biggest problem with them for hearing from multiple teams is that, frankly, they would schedule scrims and then they would cancel on scrims. So FaZe, unlike some of the other top teams in the game that do have a pretty regimented scrim schedule, was not sticking to their scrim schedule. From what I heard, sources close to it and all the rest. So it sort of brings up the idea with Overwatch is that how soon until we get to a point where players are a little bit more beholden to the management above them saying, look, you're going to keep on the schedule or else you can't just set your own hours and go, uh, maybe we just want to stream for 16 hours hours a day before and we're not gonna you know we're gonna miss a full day of practice you can't do that if you're being a serious uh, team that is definitely bad though i have heard that about a few other teams as well i don't necessarily think that is the main reason that they have been failing as hard as they have in tournaments that definitely is a factor or a contributing factor i mean so it's not like they're failing in tournaments because they're like getting blown out by like pro teams or whatever right yeah. like they're losing to oh no who is i mean they have unacceptable good players who played who played a long time in the beta? They're not bad, but they're not, you know, they're not on that the level that should be beating them. Yeah, it's, it isn't acceptable. Like you would expect a pug of these players to be able to win that match, basically, like with the talent they have in the lineup. Like Clamp has amazing aim. Mendo was, you know, once considered one of the top five players in the game by by a lot of people, and you know, the I other mean, guys are, are well, solid too. So, I mean, it's like there's more issues than just that that seem to be like holding them back. I mean. I don't know. It's it's kind of mind-boggling. <laughs> I mean, for me, it, it comes down a lot of it to Mendo Kusai. He is the in-game leader. The team's kind of built around him as the all-star player. 
Um, he's had the most success in competitive Overwatch so far. He is responsible for calling the meta and the picks that they play and how they play and what they're going to be doing. He is also the person that recruited Vainless and recruited Evoke to the team. So a few of these things comes down to his in-game leading in terms of the actual gameplay that's happening and him bringing in these players, which from all from everything that we've heard, then he now and that he got rid of uh, as Clamp, Mendo and Wonderfuls agreed they to get rid of Evoke and Fraud and Vainless. Now, they are still signed to FaZe. They have not been released by the organization. They are still under contract to FaZe. They are just no longer on the roster. FaZe did agree to letting this new roster, each of the different times they had a new roster, so most recently in the ESL tournament, they agreed to having too easy play in the event and Blam uh, play as well. So that, that was known to the team, but nothing has really worked out right uh, throughout this whole process. So now there's the situation where three of the players aren't wanted by the first three on the team, uh, but they're still contracted by the org, and they haven't gotten results through the entirety of any of the lineups that they've tried so far, including the initial one, the first change, and the most latest iteration at ESL. So a bunch of it, you know, really comes, comes back to Mendo, and I think part of it for me is the picks that they play, and I feel like it hasn't been completely the right call. Some of it has been the meta shifts, and I think we going out of Widow McCree has probably hurt them quite a bit. Maybe McCree coming back will be a little better for them, and roster instability has not worked out so well. I'm not convinced they would win with Vainless or Evoke or Fraud either. I think I, I can see where some of the Concern there is from. I mean, they've never had a track record of winning, right? Like, it's not like no. it's a team that's like underperforming. Like, they've been pretty consistent well, at this core level. I'll say this much too. You look at the what happened the ESL qualifiers. Uh, there are a few things that really stood out to me in terms of just mechanically on the players themselves. One is that Clamp is a phenomenal hit scan player. This is a hit scan meta. He ended up on Diva. Now, I get the argument there was that, okay, too easy, can't play Diva, throw too easy on it. Too easy is worse at McCree, and anything hits scan when compared to Clamp. Clamp is just better. That's a mistake, mistake number one. And mistake number two, and this is as much as, I guess, a mistake of that day, but the other thing that's really been affecting them is that there is a point where I think most people agree that Mendo was a tier one DPS right up there with Share 4, Tavik, Tailspin, all the rest, and that he's still a very good player, but we haven't seen him take over a game in the way that he did back in the IDD QD glory era in a very long time. Now, I don't know if that means that he was he started out with a very high baseline and other people have caught up, or it just means that he's been slacking as of late. But you look at his results, Mendo used to take over games much more regularly than he does now. That's just fact. I mean, and I, I don't know. I mean, he's like what, a 17-year-old kid, right? Like, he's he's yeah. really young. He's he's new to esports. Now he's in a leadership position on the team, as Rod says, which kind of seems like an awkward place for him to be. Like, when he was on IDQD, he didn't have to be the guy. He had other people who could carry if he was having an off day. And, you know, he could... He could be in a relaxed environment. He probably had people helping in terms of telling him what to do, what picks to play, and things like that. So, I mean, I think, you know, as Rod said, it points to him as the issue. Maybe he really shouldn't be in that leadership position. Some of these other guys need to really step up and do that. Um, and I, I think that's probably a large part of the problem because they just don't know how to basically be on the same page, like when they're playing in game. I mean, if they have a lot of individual talent, you know, that, that only goes so far if, if you're not really using it, you know, towards the same goal. So. I, mean, I think I'm that's the biggest point. I'm not convinced they would win championships with Evoke and Vainless and Fraud. I'm also no. not convinced that switching rosters so soon is going to help them any further. And I think we've seen that it hasn't. So I mean, you say win championships, yeah, weird, so we're not talking weird about point. championships. Yeah, <laughs> we're talking about <laughs> the tournament. No, but you know what I mean, right? The goal is to right. win titles. If you can't even make the playoffs, there is a huge and disconnect a, between the two. This is making the playoffs. Options. Okay, that, I, that comparison is way too favorable. It's more like if you can't beat your local college team <laughs> in a friendly skirmish when you're in the NBA, like you have bigger, like it, that's a little bit of this because I mean, really, for a team like FaZe to get knocked down round of 32 
in week number three where most of your contemporary really top level peers have already qualified so it's not like they even got knocked out later in the tournament which would still be a disappointment but they got knocked out round of 32 on day one it's just like but see, that not like this didn't qualify either they, they yeah no they that's one thing i think they lost to the colorado clutch which is you know a tough draw for yeah, them. Yeah, 3-0. But... They lost to Colorado yeah. Cuts 3-0, <laughs> which is definitely not a good sign for coming up to phase. I think part of the issue is, that, as ZP, as you were mentioning earlier, is they are playing cross-server. They are an NA team. They are set in the NA region, and Mendo playing on mainly hitscan characters, and as the carry DPS with the roles they've been playing, because Clamp has been on Reaper and then on D.Va, and I told I disagree with all the picks they've, they've gone into this as well, but now you have... Mendo trying to carry with 120 ping, and it works for some players. And I think he's played like okay with it, but it's not an easy situation to do. And Envy's really only getting things going now that they've moved the whole team over to America and they're all practicing together and they all have low ping together. And having a team with Europeans and North Americans on at the same time doesn't always go well for, for people. I think Nubris is a great example of it, of it going as well as it could with IDD QD, also playing from Sweden and in the same different carry role, but actually playing pretty well. On American servers and kind of proving his worth. And Vonathil, I think, is a little bit different because he's support and there's a little bit more leeway, just like Vainless is. Um, even then, though, they're still, you know, you, 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 they have a lineup where you could think that they could do better than the results they have, right? Yeah. In terms of maybe they could beat some of those well, top, top teams. But I mean, I, I think. Yeah. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. I guess what I was going to say then uh, for Nubris is that you would think so because the two things here is that one thing with Nubris is that IDDQD is really incredibly good at hit scan characters. Like, he's great. But the person that I think would I would put above him, even on the same team, is Cool Matt is also ridiculous. And you'd think with that sort of core, if they could get decent tank and support play around him, which they do have veteran players, that they would be able to put up good results. And they have come close to sort of entering the, the top echelon in NA where they could be competing with the uh, TSMs now of the world, the C9s, the Team Liquids, and all the rest, but they haven't quite put together yet. And it's a little bit perplexing because you look at the raw ingredients. I, I guess the one thing I would say there is that there's a lot of talk in Overwatch about what teams need coaches, analysts, and all the rest. If you're a team that isn't making top 16, you don't need an analyst or a coach. You need to just play better. But for a team like Nubris, I feel like they could really benefit from some extra help to sort of put them over the top. Well, now Fnatic, of course. To give FaZe a tiny bit of leeway here, just a, just a <laughs> tiny, tiny bit, there is another team with, I think, pretty similar circumstances, which are now currently looking for a sponsor who have played pretty much just as bad or maybe even worse than FaZe, and that would be the We United team consisting of Zoms, formerly of Team Liquid, uh, Clock, formerly of the, the Quake squad uh, still here, uh, Shadowburn, which I think is now currently the best Genji player in the world and one of the best fires in the world, Rip Fire. I'll talk about that later. Um, his buddy Forsaken, which is they, they were part of the Quake Fortress roster. Uh, and then along with uh, Too Easy, formerly of Reunited, and then Plus One. I think X Dobbs is the tank player there. And they played in a few Gosu, Gosu Gamers Cups, and they have lost to kind of mediocre teams themselves. And I think that they it shows that even though you can put together a team with all-star talent from several other teams and, you know, try to make things work, and on paper, on paper, FaZe and this we, we United team should be beating some of the other top-tier teams in the world based upon especially the DPS talent and the support talent, even the tank play on both of these teams, but they are getting beaten by rather mid, low- to mid-level teams in both North America and in Europe which, you know, really shows what this game is all about now. If you've been playing for several months together and you have a synergy, it really does matter more than other games. I mean, I think you should, you could see in Counter-Strike where maybe the phase Counter-Strike team hasn't been as big of a success um, maybe as they wanted to for being a superstar kind of team put together of all-star players from a bunch of other teams, but they've done pretty well. I think all in all, they've made the majors, they've come short sometimes, they've played pretty well. We're in Overwatch... I think the ability, like just being a six on six game and having an extra person on all the teams, plus having like all these crazy abilities and having to do alt usage and having to think about the game in a, in a very different way. You can't just brute force your way into victory in this game. And teams that may not have as much skill on paper can beat a team filled with all star players, I think, for short periods of time. It takes a long time for some of these teams to to get that together. I mean, I think you can overcome that chemistry gap if you have, like, good leadership on the team in terms of someone who can kind of 
know where to put the puzzle pieces together to make them, you know, work optimally, right? And I think that's probably an issue on both of those teams because I don't think anyone on the Wii United team either was really like an in-game leader in terms of you know their personality or what they've what they've done in the past. So, I mean, I think that's kind of the missing link there. And like you said, it really does make a difference. The chemistry does. I mean, we've seen a lot of these teams that have been around for forever stick around, even though there's more talent around now. So. Well, I'll say this much. I think sort of the hidden X factor of Overwatch where some teams I think have started to really get on it and other teams are still trying to figure it out. And it's probably shown very clearly and the teams have a lot of mechanical skill but can't get together is that shot calling in video games is a really big deal. Now, I'll give you an example going to another Blizzard game. Heroes of the Storm uh, was not the most mechanically demanding of games in the genre. It just wasn't. What did that mean? That meant that early Heroes of the Storm competition, the very best teams were really defined by extremely, extremely good shot calling. The original Tempo Storm team, at uh, one point that was known by a team of name of uh, Symbiote Gaming, basically ran over everyone because their main shot caller in Dreadnought was just way better than everyone else at doing that. But it's hard to sort of identify that in Overwatch where how do you make proper shot calls and all the rest because you have a lot more individual skill components that muddy the waters. If you have a phenom of a talent on your team, like a Tavik or a Tailspin, that will randomly win entire matchups for you because they kill two, three people in one go, it's hard to go, well, did we make the right shot call or not? But I think as the scene goes on and you do get more things like better analysis, better coaches, hopefully replays one day. Uh, Demos. And, and just Demos. sort of a better... <laughs> and a better understanding of the game, maybe we'll see that part develop. Because I do think that that part, if you could sort of distill a team into some of its parts, is probably where teams that have been doing well but are underperforming could be bad shot calling. Teams that are doing really bad with really good mechanical skill, absolutely poor shot calling. There's nothing else it could really be. I mean, Mendo and Shadowburn are definitely some of the best players in the world right now. Maybe Mendo has had a bit of a fall off um, as you say, but I think the McCree coming back probably will help him a lot. And Shadowburn, we'll see how much the Farrah is going to affect him. But they're still definitely some of the best DPS players in the world, and they cannot make things work even against mediocre teams in both of their regions. So I really think, as you say, that shot calling really does matter, and, and choices matter, and inexperience, I think, is a big part of that. And that's why some teams, even with a lot of talent, have not just done as well as other teams, which some would look down upon as maybe not having the talent, but they really have the strategy and the positioning to to get far. Agreed. <laughs> All right. So this is somewhat related to what we were talking about, but the next topic we had lined up here was just talking about the big signings that came down this week. TSM has picked up Code 7. Fnatic has picked up Nubris. And you know, we just want to talk about do both of these teams deserve the pickups? And then what about the sort of mechanics with going on Fnatic where they have half an A, half a U? Are they going to relocate to one region or another? Should they? They and said they in probably... the announcement that uh, they're going to be based in NA, I believe. Yeah. Okay. And there's going to so... be some more, more announcements about that in the future, but I think that's that's their plan going forward. Um, probably in part because of things like E-League. I think there's more happening in NA and there's more investment money in the NA scene. But I think that should help some of the issues we were talking about earlier where... It's not as easy to play, you know, in both regions as maybe it was like early in the beta when there wasn't as much talent. And I think the net code was actually more favorable when in the early closed beta than it is now for, for doing that. So, I mean, I think that's going to, that should help Fnatic a lot. And, may, you know, maybe they will be able to become really, you know, instead of like a, I mean, I wouldn't call them a tier two team. They're still a tier one team, but one that could actually challenge at the top, the very top. The interesting thing, by the way, for those uh, who don't know, is that the Fnatic signing Nubris was basically an open secret in the comp scene for a really long time. Like, everyone pretty much knew it happened at some point, but it's interesting that Fnatic, the trigger of this got pulled right before the E-League announcement. So I don't know if that meant that Fnatic was a little bit hesitant or things were moving slow and they said, look, we just got to do the announcement now. But certainly, I feel like it was spurred on a little bit by the announcement because everyone sort of knew this was a thing for a while. And then now it's finally coming out. Okay, Fnatic has signed Nubris. And then, of course, TSM, who is really te testing the waters for a while, suddenly comes on and goes, okay, we're just going to sign Code 7 right here, right now. And I think the TSM signed Code 7 thing developed much more quickly. I mean, I don't think either what? team actually signed the contracts till last week. Probably takes a while yeah. for them to get ready to announce, but 
obviously both have had interest for old, for a while. I mean, I know TSM has been sniffing around teams, and I think a lot of that is driven by E League uh, coming out soon because you know all these orgs are going to want to get they're going to want to get on television. Like, who doesn't want to be on television, right? <laughs> so. I mean, that's definitely driving uh, a lot of the interests. And I think there's going to be some more big stuff announced soon, too. So, um. Both announcements were definitely spurred on by this week announcement to get things done right before it happened. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind about that. And these talks have been happening for a little while for both of them. I think the Nubris one was the more expected one and the one that's been going on the longest. They've been discussing with Fnatic for a decently long time now. They had a few other offers from several other teams, but this is the one that felt the most comfortable for both Fnatic um, and, and the Orcs. So this one fits really well. I mean, IDDQD, so they have a sweet IDDQD in Bonneville, a Swedish roster, fits very well with the Fnatic brand and everything they're doing, especially with Karn being from where he's from and him being the chief gaming officer over there, and them wanting an American team because they initially, Fnatic wanted an American team. So now they get the American team with two Swedish guys, including a Swedish in-game leader and the Swedish carry, along with Cool Man, of course, which is definitely um, a big part of this roster, and I think it's everything that Fnatic could have wanted, especially with them playing pretty well lately and putting up pretty good results um, in these events. So I think this one definitely makes a lot of sense. I think this is a very good pickup for Fnatic. I think they actually will, will play pretty well, and I think they will fight for a top three spot. I think it's going to take a little bit more time for anyone to really knock off Envy in the current state of things, and more than likely not until everyone moves over to America for Fnatic. I think still, as good as IDQD and Vonnefil can be playing from Sweden, there is a limit to how much he could really do in these matches, especially against a, top, a team like Cloud9 or, or Envy or anyone else you know, on, on low ping. So I think that is going to have to happen first. Um, and the TSM deal with Code 7, I think this is pretty indicative of why you know, Code 7 left their org. Yeah, uh, Gale for Force. Sure. Yeah, I mean, this all makes sense well, <laughs> now. <laughs> well, I mean, we said it before, and I mean, it wasn't really... You don't even need insider info to know it, is that the entire... Oh, we've split from Gale Force. It just came down to the fact that they wanted more money than Gale Force as a smaller org could provide. And TSM clearly was poking around going, look, we have to get an org for E-League that's coming up. What organization has the weakest contract was about to get out of their org where we can just pick them up and go from there and they poked around they found that gale force uh coincidentally right on their rise was also ripe for the picking so they snatched it right away from gale force and it's unfortunate for the smaller orgs but it's also sort of the way that esports works the best you can hope for a smaller org is that you have a good buyout where you get paid at least for the org moving but i don't even think gale force said that so kind of a rough run for gale force but just how it goes as the scene develops i suppose yeah, I mean, there are even more big teams sniffing around right now. Like, there's more orgs that want to get into, you know, get on E-League and get into Overwatch as it continues to grow. But there really just isn't any other talent out there. So, I mean, Gale Force, you know, when, or Code 7, when they left Gale Force, were in a really good position to basically get a great offer from a big org because they they were in demand and so many teams wanted them. And even if, even if they hadn't had this great run of form where they're, you know, getting second place in all these events even if they had lost all those games to cloud nine you know i think they'd still be in the same position so it's kind of and, and before uh, people wonder go well gee there's other teams that are in the top why don't you just go down the list of top eight why don't you pick up one shot and one shot i mean they have been kind of on the rise but they clearly have not been in the very very top tier as of yet and the thing is that these organizations they want to get involved they desperately want to get involved the ones that are involved but on the same note they also don't want to pick up a team where they're going to continually lose to the other orgs because that hurts the ability to draw on sponsors all the rest. So it's one of those things where every org wants to get in, but they want to have a team that says, all right, we'll have a legit chance of beating your Cloud Nines or Envious is the world. We don't want to pick up a team that's going to continually get goose egged by them because that just sucks. You don't want to do that. I mean, this pickup is obvious from all standpoints. Yeah. I mean, Code 7 had beaten Cloud Nine. They've been beating the top teams. This is the obvious choice for TSM to pick up now that they're no, no longer in Gale Forest and wouldn't surprise me that they probably were already discussing with TSM or maybe short, very shortly after um, departing waves with, with Gale Forest. So all this coming together also doesn't surprise me. This is definitely a good pickup for the TSM organization. Gale Forest has been playing great. Uh, Harbu's really been coming through considering everything that he's been with from LG now um, over to Co7 and then getting, getting removed from the team and coming back and then you know, really performing, and then Nicholas and Tork, and this is, uh, you know, a big thing for those guys. Now, I will have to mention here that 
Um, Nicholas and Tork are banned in Counter Strike yeah. under Sevo, uh, and previously have been VAC banned for cheating. And I can say that there are several pro, pro players in the Overwatch community that suspected they were cheating in the early Overwatch betas before they got signed. And there are even a few players right now that still think they are cheating now that they're no longer, before they got signed to TSM, uh, you know, just before them. Now, there are clips have been going around, and we see the same thing for other players that have been nominated in this special manner, like Taimu from Envy and Sure4 and Cloud9. And, of course, there's like a million videos in, in Counter-Strike for pretty much the same the same topic. There's been no definitive proof or anything. Blizzard has never mentioned any ban. There's been no bans issued for any player. There has been nothing talked about more other than Blizzard's initial statement on cheating and, and their anti-cheat and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so what do you think? Do you feel like this is an, this is an odd move for the org to be picking up Code 7, or is there no reason to be doubting these guys? They have been performing as they have been, and their results speak for themselves. I think it... Oh, go ahead, Sam. I think uh, you... I mean, to... I was going to say, like, I, I mean, I'm generally... You know, I've played FPS games for years, and every game I've ever played, people are always throwing cheating accusations around, especially in games where most of the competition happens online, right? Like, we're not going to lands where... You can really control for the cheating factor much much better um, because so many of the competitions online. So, and in those games, I feel like there's way more accusations around than people are ever actually cheating. I mean, obviously the Sebo thing aside, is, you know that's I mean it's a different game. You don't really know the details of that. They were manually banned, right? They weren't back banned or anything like that. Um, so it's hard to say, but I mean I just feel like I, I don't think they are they are cheating and. I think it's too bad that this is, you know, become such a big discussion. And I think that, you know, in another couple of months or year, it's going to be a non-issue because we're just going to have so many land tournaments. And I think that they, the players played pretty well when they did play on land, like Agents Rising already. So, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know. You know, there's always a question. I mean, there was a question when Fnatic was winning every Counter-Strike tournament, even about cheating on land, which is like ridiculous. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just too bad that this is kind of like a cloud that has to constantly hang over us. I'll say this much when it comes to esports. Uh, two things here. Number one is I completely agree with Sam, where it's hard to say. I mean, there's always accusations that are going to be thrown out. I don't know. It's one of those things where I really don't know. I would lean towards saying it's less likely that they're cheating in Overwatch, just given the fact that it doesn't really seem like the Overwatch anti cheat has been broken in any significant way. But again, you never know in these things. My, I would lean towards not. But uh, the one thing I actually want to comment on more, which is, I think, more interesting than current uh, accusations or all the rest, which are, you know, you could talk about forever, is that I do wonder in esports, where is the line for if people do get caught cheating in something, what is the penalty? I know that in esports, it ranges from everything to sweep it under the rug to lifetime ban and all the rest, where I, I feel like esports has really lagged behind in how to handle these sorts of situations where you look at, say, Major League Baseball or any really traditional sport, right? They have penalties are codified nothing that really bans someone from the game unless they continually have violations but it, it's there and all the rest it, it's also made more complex too in that you know you think about uh traditional sports if someone was a baseball player and got banned in baseball for a year would football ban them from a year also the answer is no and you sort of have that same deal right now in video gaming where if you get banned from a valve game does that mean that you should be banned from a Blizzard game? Well, Blizzard isn't going to step into that at all. They're not going to go, well, we respect Valve's ban. They don't want to subject themselves to that. So you, you have all that going on, too, even though there's a lot more overlap, arguably, between your video games that Valve and Blizzard make than, say, Major League Baseball and football. Unless well, you're both on that aspect, Blizzard has kind of already shown their cards yeah. already. The, yeah. They are okay with the players that were match-fixing in Counter-Strike, that being... Mm -hmm. um, AZK, who was on Team Liquid, and then Steel previously on Sprite, Splice, and Brax also playing Overwatch um, quite a lot. And they have issued no statements against Nicholas or Torque for this entire time throughout Overwatch. So I think they've been pretty, um, they've been, you know, kind of one way on how they view bans in other games and how that does not impact their game. And, I mean, they've also have they stated explicitly like their cheat policy in terms of like zero tolerance, right? Like that was what yeah. that big post was about and you know, response to the witch hunting um, on, on Reddit for some of the accused people. 
And I, so, I mean, I think that also brings up another issue where, like, like is, is it worth it for these guys to actually cheat, like, in Code 7's position? I mean, I think that, you know, like, people are talking about, oh, they left Gale Force and maybe they start cheating again. That's where they're having good results. But it's like that they have so much to lose in this situation where it's just like, I, I mean, I don't know. It'd just be hard to believe that they would they would do that if they could be banned permanently from the game, you know? Yeah, I mean, the way Blizzard's come out with their stance here is that we talked about penalties. What should the penalty be? Well, Blizzard has clearly come out and said that if you cheat in Overwatch, especially on the pro level, it is the death penalty. That is it. There is no way back. If they did get caught one way or another, uh, that would be it. Of course, that also brings in the weird element here, too, where a lot of players have gotten their accounts hacked as of late. Like, uh, there's been weird hacking yeah. going on the scene. So what happens if someone hacks, say, Chips of Jin's account and his account did get hacked recently, then goes on it and downloads some like, or does something to trip the Blizzard anti cheat and then they get banned. Are they banned for life? Like, how do you clear that up? That's actually a real problem. Well, that's another. happened in Counter Strike, and several players have claimed that their accounts were hacked, and Valve um, continued the VAC ban and did not unban. But there have also been some players who said that they were hacked, and Valve looked into it and they did unban them. So I think that Blizzard would have the same tools. Okay. To be able to look into cases like that and be able to make those same decisions. So I have two things here for you, ZP. One, because there is no evidence and that be determining, and this is very weird right now in esports with how cheating can happen on a very high level. And all these match matches, by the way, are we playing online, not even on LAN, yeah. and we don't know what the hell is going on, which is a larger issue than most people should be looking at, but that because we do not have anything from blizzard which is the only people we can rely on other than third party anti-cheat maybe like esl wire unless either of these are going to be catching anyone and announcing that people are banned then i see no reason why gale force and code code 7 does not deserve to be picked up by tsm as one yeah. of the best teams in north america and they definitely deserve their sponsorship now saying this cp are you really this naive where you do not think that the game has been already cracked immediately and broken up with private cheats spread across mm. players and people. We've seen in Counter-Strike, we, we've already seen how much the game can be broken by like Overwatch ESP and these new these new public cheat makers, where I, I do not have as much faith as you may in terms of how effective the current anti-cheat, which we do not know what it is or how it works, or how any of if it's even as good as Valve's back, which we know isn't as good because there have been cheaters who've been cheated, like Kaylee, who've been banned, and Valve never said why or what he did or what happened or how they caught him or what or anything, <laughs> right? So then, how do why, why would you have any faith that they would be as good or better here in a Blizzard game where we don't even know anything about the anti cheat or what's going on? So in terms of that ZP, there I am not like comforted anymore by the blizzard being here or whatever they are telling me mm. is not like making me feel, oh, okay, everything's good. No one's cheating, everything's online, but that doesn't matter. Uh, and nothing's fishy and that everyone is totally kosher. You know, like I am not uh. nearly in that mode and I am being disagree with Sam. I, I I am not convinced that they're, they're not cheating based on previous history. Now, I think the only thing that comes down to always is the developers and that no one besides them other than a leak from maybe a cheat coder or a former pro player who is cheating or a teammate or whatever uh, is going to be able to say any different. So until Valve or Blizzard or whoever the game maker is decides to ban a player, there's nothing that we can really do other than have circumstantial evidence, video footage, clips, which none of it can really be used to make a, a conclusion on things and i totally understand that but i you know this is not black and white to me um this subject especially considering the amount of talk that has been had for certain players already in the overwatch community not even counting other games like counter-strike where there's already discussions amongst pro players and journalists and casters that are behind the scenes which i think are never as good as maybe what people want to seem all right, that was incredibly long, and then uh, Pro Talk was just adding on to it, or struggling not to laugh. But I guess to your main point, where am I so naive as to think that people haven't cracked it? I think it's mixed. I'm not going to say that it hasn't been fully cracked by some savant out there. 
somewhere. I'm not saying that that hasn't happened, but I do think that it is a much trickier game to crack and get away with it than other games are. I've certainly had, you know, heard things from people, which is the most I'll say that lends to the idea that it's not a particularly easy game to hack and have that sort of advantage right now and, and all the rest. But sure, I mean, it could be a thing. It just for me is that the burden of proof for the proof that someone to me is cheating is pretty darn high. And unless it's met, I'm going to sit there and say the most I'll say for things be like, that's kind of suspicious. And then you really have to look at the total body of evidence. I don't know. I think for, for me on a personal level, nothing has really been met to where I think anyone right now is cheating. It's a combination where I do have some faith in uh, the systems that are in place right now. And it's also the goes back to more Sam meant the risk reward where it's true. There is a lot of potential reward right now if someone were to get away with cheating. There's immeasurable reward. But the risk with the lifetime ban and the fact that people probably don't know how everything in Overwatch works right now and the fact that a sudden update or something could ruin your career forever and the fact that, if we're talking about TSM specifically, that they did really well at LAN, I don't know. I I, I don't I, I don't mean to hate on uh, your parade or, or Sam here, <laughs> but I will throw in a little bit of context that the manager now for the team is the same manager for the land that they add as their first land in overwatch so i do not exactly have a whole lot of confidence and from what i heard at that land none of the computers were checked by admins there was nothing to to make any type of circumstances that players weren't cheating and now the organizer and the main admin tifa for that event is now the manager for the team so if you want to use that event as an example of why they're not cheating that's definitely not it. I mean, now it's not saying that they are. And look, I'm not saying none of it is, but you cannot. That's tell the whole me issue. This is a thing. It's just going to be black. There's like there is no black and white. It's just going to be this gray area forever until like mm -hmm. you have you know like the LCS where they lock up your gear, you know, inside a a safe until you play your match, and those are the only equipment you can use, right? Like, I don't know this little like cheating Counter Strike thing on LAN. It's like LAN used to be like the gold standard. It's like you couldn't cheat on LAN, right? But now we have this gray area too, and so what are you gonna do? Like, you're just gonna doubt everyone, and you're just gonna live like that? Like, it's just I don't know. There's no solution to that problem, really, right? Like, there's nothing. I, don't, I mean, I think Blizzard is doing the best job they can with the NA cheat. They know it's like a major issue that they have to really focus on and address. They're not being very public with what they're doing about it, but there's good reasons for that because if they are public about how they're they're countering these cheats, then yeah. obviously it opens op, op, opens up for cheat makers to you know, get around their countermeasures. So, I mean, I think it's fine that it's kind of behind closed doors. If someone does get caught, I'll hope that they would be transparent with the details of, you know, that, those cases, especially for pro players. We'll have to wait and see if that happens, if ever, hopefully not. But I mean, I just feel like it's just, like there's just so many wasted words talking about this issue because what's the solution? You know, there's we're, we can just go in circles forever and we're not going to get well, anywhere. I, I will say have that, that land where everything really is locked down. I will say this is that in general, when it comes to ban administration, all the rest, just given how a company like Blizzard usually operates, I will say this as far as the bans go, it's going to be exceptionally rare for any ban to ever be manually applied based off a vision test, because quite frankly, I don't think anyone in the Blizzard esports department, and this, I mean, I would never want to be in this position of trying to go at Judgment Call and be like, I'm going to declare this player a cheater and ban them from everything. So I feel like no one is going to get banned by any sort of manual test ever. No. It's only going to try to ban someone by a manual test. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Is he even uh, like uh, the greatest right, teammate saying, in the world qualified to do that? Like, right, can he just no. watch someone play and know? Like, right. No, I mean, so, it's, uh, it's super obvious with like an aimbot or something. Right. Yeah. But even then, like, that's still, do you want to be the person who makes that call? Probably not. And then the se and I'm not saying anyone should be making that call for the record. I'm just noting uh, as a setup to my next point, which is that the only way people will get banned one way or another will be as if they trip the software that is defending the game. If they do that, then they'll get banned. That's probably the only bans you will ever see dished out that will be respected on the professional level. And... I guess until that point, we'll have to see. But until that point, speculating doesn't do any good. You just have to assume that everyone is legitimate, barring extreme suspicion uh, otherwise. I mean, no, do you think there's something that should be that done, Rod? Uh, like, is there no. a solution to this problem? Or, I mean... No, I mean, you can't use video evidence as, as anything. Um, I, and nothing can be done. Blizzard just needs to have... Well, we'll, we'll see. I actually have no idea. We'll just see... Mm -hmm what Blizzard has in store for Cash and Cheaters and these online tournaments and yada yada. My main original question was really, 
TSM as an organization picking them up with this type of surrounding them. And even though I'm putting this out there where I think that there's a lot of circumstantial stuff and cheating is a big issue and we need to look into it, I, I don't, I think personally that it, I'm okay with TSM picking it up. I don't think TSM should take flack for um, Nicholas and Torek and what they previously done until something has been proven. But I will say, you know, with the amount of talk that had been happened between pro players in the closed beta, not the, not the community, not the scene. I'm talking the actual players that play in the pro community being suspicious of several other players, that that is something to take note of. I mean, I agree, but I also agree that, you know, Tia, like Code 7 deserves to be picked up by TSM. Um, yeah. Even TSM is one yeah. of the biggest esports organizations out there, maybe the, the biggest one in North America. And, you know, maybe that's a bit of a risk, but I, I mean, I think that it was a good decision by them. So we'll see. All righty. Well, I think we've covered pretty much everything with TSM and Fnatic. That brings us on to, of course, talking about recent events in the scene of uh, no more importance than the recent patch. Lots of uh, things have changed, both balance wise and a new hero. ESL now allow, will be allowing Ana for the next week of qualifiers. So pretty much everyone will be allowing Ana. So we're going to see the, get to see her in comp play. We'll get to see the impacts of her on the meta. And of course, as speaking of meta, we do get to see the full effects now of McCree changes, D.Va getting uh, the super upgrade to <laughs> her uh, defense matrix and more. So I guess anyone have any burning issues that they want to talk about on there uh, to start this off? Uh, well, are we going to talk about the U League announcement first before we... That we were going to do that meta? after the oh, meta you, stuff. You want to do meta, meta stuff first? Okay. Yeah, meta stuff. Meta stuff. Where to begin all of <laughs> just the joy that you can experience playing competitive Overwatch the last few days? You know, when I want to play a first-person shooter game, I know that I want all the shots that I take, no matter if it's a hit scan. Uh, character or a projectile character to be eaten progressively throughout the match on a toggle with right click because that makes me feel really good just so good about a first person shooter game where i know that all of the things that i shoot don't do anything and i just want to know what you guys that you uh, you agree with me here you <laughs> love it right just I, all I think the that, stuff i mean i said it last week i think that Blizzard is very good at creating heroes that are just not fun to play against in all of their games. They just have like this talent for doing that. Where like, I mean, I'm deep. Like, I think they were successful in their goals with the diva buffs in terms of like making her more viable tank, oh, where she can actually yeah. tank damage and eat up damage. And I think in some ways it works for her because it was a little skill based, like the ability to use the shield on demand. But when you play against it, it just feels like there's literally nothing you can do. It just feels like you may as well just turn and shoot someone else and then she kills you. You can't, you know, it's just, it's impossible. It's just so frustrating. So, you know, I, I think that they still need to find like a middle ground between that because I think that they need to look at that anti-fun level a little, a little harder with, with some of the, those design decisions. <laughs> Yeah, the diva. The weird thing about that too, that change is that it maybe the reason why they made the changes is to give her more flexibility and shielding for her team. That was the idea: is that okay, she's gonna be able to shield off threats a little bit more often, run with the team, sort of being an alternative to Reinhardt. What it actually turned her into was a diva can jump on whoever she wants and be dual master five thousand as she turns the shield <laughs> on and off in your face like some little kid turning, like grabbing a flashlight and just just flicking it in your face like I, it is the worst thing ever now not every diva is even exploiting it to its maximum potential like there's plenty of times in mccree where i'll be able to win the mccree versus diva fight but if the diva is really being adamant about just flashing her d defensive matrix on and off it is the most irritating thing in the world it, oh god it is it's miserable of course i'm also playing mccree i probably deserve every bad thing that happens to me but still while we're playing a diva i'm throwing that in there Blizzard somehow thinks that making D.Va the least used, one of the least used characters in the entire game and being pretty bad all around, and then making her like the best character in the game is somehow good balance. I wanna just 
Zan, Jeff Goodman, can you come over to my house and tell me what the hell you're doing? What is this? How is this making the game better? It is so good that every comp match since the patches included D.Va, every team including D.Va. That's how good and broken it is. And I, on top of it being entirely unbalanced, which is this one aspect which blows my mind of how this went from the PTR patch realm into live without, like, any type of anyone... Yeah, I know people said this is this is not this is not good. We need to do something, and they they let that through. But then at the same time, just on top of it being so good, it's not fun. It's not fun. Yeah. It doesn't make the matches better to <laughs> spectate. It doesn't make the matches better to cast. It doesn't make games better to play on a high level. I mean, I I, I played you know pretty high level well, matchmaking. I, it's in every single game now. It's just not a fun thing to experience. I don't, know. I don't understand either of the the thinking here. Well, on this. Please tell me, ZP. Tell me. Well, there, there's Give two good the things reason. I'll say here is that I have picked up, as in stolen uh, from Mabel and Spazzo, respectively, here, some new terms for casting with the new balance changes. Was that for McCree, you now have McCree Sports, which, of course, a pun on esports as you watch McCree in every game, railgunning people. And then for uh, Spazzo, I think he said uh, something to the effect of Proton. I was like, I hate going up against Diva and her. Korean future vacuum. So I'll be using both these phrases, McCree Sports and Korean Future Vacuum, in casts to go forward. But uh, I don't know. I think the thing with Diva is that they did want to give her more viability. They wanted to get her above the almost 0% pick rate that she had on every map that wasn't the Bonnie. It's just, I'm not sure the shielding change was the right way to go about it. I mean, it could, maybe it is just to be sure? tweaked a little bit. Well, you're unsure? You're, you, you don't know yet, ZP? Do well, you, the you, you think the shielding change? Like, yeah, what do you the think? clarification was going to be is that I don't know if cha is in. I don't know if changing shielding period was the way they go. Maybe shielding is would be fine with different numbers, or maybe they should have gone a different way and then made her more of an assassin tank where she was got more speed I mean, or something like that. Previously, she was supposed like it designed as almost an assassin tank, but she was basically wasn't a tank even though she was like a giant wad of armor. She just died instantly because you just headshot her a million times when she she faces you and, and and it was over. So I mean, I think that they needed to do something that made her more of a tank role, I guess, if they want her to be a tank character. But, I mean, I think they went a little overboard. I don't know, do you think that, like, the shield change could feel better if there was, like, a 1.5 second cooldown on toggling it or a two second cooldown? Or, like, if you had to have, like, a full second of charge or something before you cast it? Because I think you can cast it on, like, a even less uh than that, right? I, I think for me, the one thing that would make it a little bit more bearable to me, and I don't know if this would make it feel too clunky on the Divas end, it might, is something like a 0.25 second uh, startup time to it. So with an animation, so you actually knew it was coming up. I think the most annoying thing about fighting a Diva right now is that you're fighting a Diva, and then she's just going to randomly, instantly bring up her shield and eat something huge. And she eats a lot of ultimates with that Korean future vacuum. <laughs> like, so stuff goes in there to die literally out of nowhere. Just like, okay, hit E. It's just like, I don't know. It's just feedback on when the shield is coming up, feedback on how much shield time she has left is really lacking. So it makes decision making against it actually really hard on top of whatever raw power it is. But I just feel like the actual combat feedback on when she's going to shield, how long she's going to shield, it's not really there at the moment, visually or audio or on an audio level. I think that definitely piles on to some of the frustration. If Blizzard's going to include a character that can deflect half the ults back at the uh, at your team, then you know what? If there's a character that can eat all of them too, I guess it's not like so far out of the realm of imagination because they already have this other freaking feature of the game. <laughs> wow, how bad could this be? But I mean, I mean the whole, all of it is, is not good. I'm not a fan of any of these mechanics really. I don't. I think. I mean, I don't understand that. Blizzard wants to incorporate all these different things and these different games and these different types of, you know, um, abilities that you can have. I don't love ones that take away, like, the entire aspect of aiming in a first-person shooter game. This does not make me feel good. It doesn't make me feel good to watch or to oh. play or any type of thing. So the whole ability and then making it toggled and now the whole metagame is, like, trying to bait out seconds of the D.Va and then count, like, how much seconds left is in her matrix and it's dumb it's not better it's not like better for everyone or, or the players or make it a deeper game or anything it's just kind of lame like supremely freaking lame well yeah i mean it is kind of interesting in, in that the way her shield works like the other shields in the game like winston and reinhardt you have to use more tactically 
whereas her shield is basically like reactive. You can just use it at any any instant when you know you you need to basically. So I think that like creates a different dynamic, like where it is way more frustrating to deal with because it's it's harder for you to basically counter what she's doing. Plus, you oh, yeah, can damage their shields and remove them, which you can't do with Diva, right? You just have to bait it out, like you said. Yeah, Reinhardt, you can just uh, damage down the shield over time or flank him at any point. You can only cover one side, even despite uh, what Internet Hulk would have you believe as he does, you know, <laughs> 360s five times a second. Uh, real McCree's usually, or real Reinhardt's aren't doing that, though. It makes you wonder why not. Like, I, I can't feel like comp Reinhardt's play chronically low sensitivities, but topic for another time. Uh, one thing, though, interesting about D.Va, actually, before we go on and on even more so about her, just I mean, I know it is that she's sort of been the vortex of discussion here where we've McCree, of course, is probably issue number two. And then Zyana, it seems like people are mostly OK with him, or at the very least, he's gotten away with a lot less hate than uh, the other things that got changed in the patch. Uh, well, OK, to finish off D.Va, they could have just increased move speed on attack. They could have did a whole bunch of things. I am frustrated with a bunch of the balance changes they've had across characters across the board. Please, Blizzard, make it stop. <laughs> make it stop. Not even another day more of this diva. Bring it down. Take it away. It's not going to happen. But um... I think they'll nerf it a little bit. They'll tone it down some, but I think they're going to keep the core mechanic the same way. So probably just have to learn to live with it, Rob. It's unfun. <laughs> it's unfun. It's un-FPS. Stop doing this to the game. <laughs> Uh, Mickey, now, on the very flip side, the McCree buff has made the game You're complaining about FPS. more FPS, dude. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I mean, really, but you if I am complaining about Diva, the game? Like, what, what's wrong with you? I gotta give it to, to Blizzard. Finally put in my Quake Railgun, just like it was oh, in, in the first uh, pre close beta. Thank you, Blizzard. Reinstating uh, fall off. Now you can, everyone can have two snipers or three snipers. Well, now I, I will say Widow back to like 175 body shot damage it, or whatever. Like the, the McCree changes made this is that if you want to rank up right now, uh, pro tips for ranking up in the game at the moment, a make sure if you're going in a group, make sure that someone uh, is, if it's off a complete group, make sure that someone in your group can a play McCree and B has the game on their SSD and will be able to consistently grab McCree before anyone else. Because if you're queuing in the seventies with say a duo queue, and you lose the McCree pick to someone in the low 60s that the game has put on your team, you are going to lose. That is how important he is right now in the meta and on your team. So, uh, I mean, it's interesting how good McCree is really important. Well, I mean, we're talking about a really competitive play and professional yeah, play and sure. how it's going to affect, you know, the real realm of not, not just the Howard Duo. I mean, well, like with, with the higher yeah, you're gonna see everything. like exponential scaling in terms of like how effective yeah. the McCree player is. So like, at the competitive level, if you have a player who is hitting, you know, 55% of shots compared to 50%, that makes like a pretty huge difference over, over the course of a match, especially if you're getting a couple extra headshots. So, I mean, I think that it really does have, you know, we talked about how it's going to affect teams earlier in terms of like more hit scan being in the meta. And, you know, it's like a really big difference. And I, I don't know. I'm not, you know, like. It is interesting because they were arguing about how, you know, things that lower the skill gap, remove FPS ability, but then we're also like, well, maybe there's too much FPS? Is that a thing? I mean, like, <laughs> I am actually, I was less upset about the McCree now being totally OP because at least it promotes, and, and McCree took a huge hit after the right click sure. fall off, where he yeah. was not played uh, nearly at all. Um, this was including in the Farah meta. So you had a Farah meta with, and see, people still weren't playing McCree, even though there were players like IDDQD that definitely showed it could work even before the most recent buff. So I can understand what Wizard was thinking. Well, um, this right click, which is a stupid freaking ability anyway in the game, and no wonder it returned to crap. But they made this dumb thing to begin with, and they put it in and made it as right click. So they took that away, and didn't make it as good. So I understand why white teams weren't using it as much. Um, we even talked previously on this show how McCree would probably come back no matter if there was going to be a change or not. So uh, even though I'm not as frustrated, I, I will say that like, as, with, as good as players are going to get in the game, why revert the fall off to as good as it is if and you're going to keep Widow all, all messed up and not played? Like it, It's much better to have... You can out-snipe the Widow now. I mean, it's harder and you got to have flick game, but we're talking about a first-person shooter with some of the best FPS players... FP, you know, DM deathmatch players in the world, they're going to be able to flick to a widow across the map with McCree when she can kill her kind of instantly. Like, that is going to happen, and we're going to see that 
see that more. So I, I don't necessarily think this really is the greatest decision on having to buff McCree back to this level. I would rather they, well, you know, decrease the damage a little bit. I don't think this is entirely necessary. I, I think the reason why McCree did get the buffs in all likelihood is that you look at the meta, especially on the top end for a really long time, is that a lot of top end matches effectively devolved into who had the better Farah in a lot of cases, where if you had Tailspin and he could win most of your Farah v. Farah duels, well, it was going to be really difficult because you didn't really have a non Farah option for dealing with it. Eventually, teams were starting to run McCree and 76 together, but it's still really, really rough. So I think the idea of the McCree buff is to make it, A, a little bit easier to deal with Farah, and then B, uh, was also probably the buff is when we're at lower MMRs, although I don't know if how I mean, successful that's going to be. Like, I don't know. If you're worried about Farah, though, you're adding, like, your buffing's in the auto a huge amount. So he's True. viable. He's not just going to get like Farrah can't just spam him down like you know she can't can one shot him. Yeah, can't have yeah. one shot. And yeah. like you're also adding Anna to the game, who also could dink Farrah, make it dangerous for her to fly in the sky. Like, so I mean, I think you're you're already adding things to deal with her now. Basically, Farrah's dead. Like no one's going to run Farrah's her except on very dead. maybe very specific points, maybe, but probably even you know then it's like a risky pick. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't think that that was necessarily like a good response when you take into account like the whole shift of the meta that you're doing because you know like soldier 76 can kill farah she's got a discord orb on her like uh, that, that's pretty easy and um, mccree can still do damage even you know before before they buffed his his left click again so i don't know i mean it you know i can see that it's kind of being a justification but i also feel like obviously like you have to look at the bigger picture which blizzard i'm sure was aware of so I'm, I'm not sure. It, it, it was definitely an odd change. I mean, in, in addition, people. what's preposterous to me is by buffing McCree, why did they nerf Soldier? Why yeah. did they have to do both at the same time? Like, if you're going to buff McCree back to God status with, you know, hit the best hit scan players, why would you nerf the other hit scan character, which had come into the meta because oh. the other two were taken out, oh. being Widow and McCree? So now you're just completely taking Soldier more than likely well, out of a lot the of soldier, Do you think that there's the, an aspect of them balancing? I mean, we're we're talking about the competitive scene, right? We're talking about the pro scene, basically. Yeah. And, like, the highest levels of competitive play queue, basically. Like, McCree was... I think he has pretty low win rate if you look at all levels of play, even if he's a monster at the top level. I mean, do you feel like they felt he needed a buff because of that? Like, in lower level play, he's not being very effective, where, you know, if you're hitting... Instead of hitting four out of five shots, you're hitting two out of five or something. You need the extra damage to do anything, right? You think that might be one of the reasons that, that this happened? I, I think for McCray, my guess is that the primary reason would be the fair stuff, but a secondary reason would probably be that because, again, I don't know the numbers. I'm not sure if there's any way of really getting the numbers from any of the unofficial websites here, but I got to think that the way McCree is set up right now where you have to just land left clicks, repeated left clicks to do well, that he must have just an abysmal win rate. And now that he can't really run in and right click. Like, I think back when he actually had right click shotgun, he probably had an okay win rate, but once they made that fan change, I just got to think that his win rate at lower levels has to be... Not so good, but I think that was probably only a minor factor, sort of a, oh, yeah, this probably helps this a little bit too type of thing. I mean, I think Blizzard looks at probably all types of things. They don't just look at the professional play, but they look at how the characters are being used in the different ranks, and they probably balance characters um, all like this. It's just Blizzard's balancing on characters overall is just really weird to me. Like, if... Because if you say this, Sam, and they see these results, why did they take away his fall off to begin with? It really seems like they're just compensating, take, nerfing the right click, which should have never existed in yeah. the first place. This is what is pissing me off about a lot of these <laughs> these changes. Like it felt like with Mercy too, they took away uh, Mercy res by 20%, and in uh, in the comments. They boosted damage boosting to 50%. And the reasoning they gave was because players were taking out their pistol too much and they wanted to give her an additional boost in damage. Did we ever talk about any of that in pro games? Anyone saying, you know what? Mercy's damage isn't as amazing as it was before. It should go back to 50%. It feels like, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the reasoning that they're telling me that it, they made the boosted damage more because of the pistol is just like a complete workaround reasoning for telling me that they're nerfing Mercy res and they don't want people to stop playing Mercy, so they're going to boost damage back to 50%. And I don't well... believe the initial reason of, of the blaster thing, and I think that their whole, like, reasoning of 
getting McCree back to insane um, fall off damage because they included a right click, which should have never been as powerful as it was, is very bad reasoning to me of why it's things should happen. Well, you wouldn't think a hero like Mercy has issues in terms of uh, just general win rate, but she does. Uh, that's one thing, just globally. Mercy's win rate, despite being the most competitively important hero for a very long time now, even throughout that entire patch where Mercy and Comp had you know, something like a 97% pick rate, and everything was decided on, did the Mercy live, did the Mercy die? In the overall context of the game, Mercy had a terrible win rate, so from an overall balancing perspective is that if you nerf Mercy because she is incredibly god-tier must-pick in comp, which who knows, she still might be. I think it, the jury's still out on that to some extent. But if you nerf her there, there is sort of this idea that, okay, we got to give her something because you can't balance only for the top 1% as much as players want to do that. The problem is so, and, giving her the damage yeah. boost is a horrible balance for the top 1%. Right. Because, no, I agree. Because that's under, that's under change that scales with the skill of the players involved. Right. Because if you're hitting more shots on the person that's boosted, like you're gonna add even more extra damage with 20% with more. So that that really affect, that only affects like the highest level. It does not really helping the lower level players. So. Right, and that, did get, and that did get reverted when that was sort of brought into thing. I just think that they wanted to give Mercy something to try and even that out so she wasn't as disadvantaged. The other thing I wanted to mention, by the Why? way... Why? She... The res was insane! Insanity! It was like, never supposed to be this thing to begin get. with! How can you even defend how fast it was going no, as not, it is? It should have not, never actually been the current way. There's no reason to compensate boosting something uh, else to take away something that should not have existed. Right, no, I'm not defending the top end at all. I'm just saying that the general idea there is that when you think about how a balanced designer is looking at those things, they're not only thinking of the 1%, so that sort of in their eyes that, okay, we need to tone down Mercy. She's way too good in comp. But then it's just like, oh, but her win rate is still terrible everyone else. So it's one of those things where they're probably just thinking, okay, we got to give her something. It didn't work out. One thing I did want to say, by the way, about uh, 76 is that 76, uh, I'm pretty sure the only reason why he got nerfed was that it was to break the macro. There was this perception, rightly or wrongly, by a growing percentage of the community that as far as 76 went, that playing him with a macro was better. I don't think top players are playing him with macros and all the rest, but it was a fact that his stuff was macroable. I don't really like the change going in because of the boogeyman of people running macros, but I'm pretty sure that's the re main reason why that happened is that they didn't want eventually the best way of playing McCree to be players running, you know, an, I don't know, uh, auto hockey macro in the background, uh, left clicking, uh, for pre precision, but I, I do think that's a little bit of a silly reason the nerf 76 and it it doesn't feel great the way the nerf went about there. I mean, especially when now McCree basically just overshadows him in almost every conceivable way at the role that, you know, they're set up to do. We've seen a, like a, a day or two of tournaments and I've watched and scrimmed. The soldier's out. It's already out. It was like one of the number one picks the last month. To be fair, though, even if they didn't nerf him, I mean, it'd still probably be the same way it is, right? So. Uh, yes, but I think we would probably see more Soldier McCree together just because Widow is not in there and Hitscan is still going to rule for players that are really good at this game. Like, the Western players are going to continue to use Hitscan, especially with Farrah being out. Um, there's, like, a whole ton, ton of possibilities within that, which I, I could see... Um, sort of coming into place too. So the two characters we haven't yet mentioned, one Zenyatta is the actually the only one which I think they got pretty much right. I think the major yeah. complaints were he didn't have enough health. Um, well, one is the hitboxes are totally messed up and they have made the hitboxes better on a few things like Hanzo's arrow, but they haven't changed Zenyatta's hitbox. So that part didn't get better, but they gave him more health. They didn't give him faster move speed, but one or the other, I think it's okay. Um, I, think, I, think, so I think that one's actually... Not bad. The old change I, was definitely needed too, like the output. Oh yeah. Because now, uh, now it can actually, you can actually live against damage ults basically when you use it. So, race it, cars and all, pretty <laughs> fantastic. Uh, I still think <laughs> I mean, that. I think it's, um, well, they also made the, the speed of the orbs be faster, which I yeah. think is good too. My main issue is I still think Discord is broken as a mechanic, and they've. Now that Zen doesn't die to one shot Amped Farah's and Farah's gone anyway, even though Amped McCree can still take Zen to like 30 or 20 health or whatever, 15 health, whatever it is, which is a big problem. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's, it's freaking bad for Zenyatta. It's probably even worse than the Farah rockets. But um, Discord is still really good. And now that Zen doesn't die as fast, 
Discord as an ability is still super strong. So Zen is Zen. Yeah, and I think the Zen I think Zen would probably be getting complained about a little bit more if not for the sniper McCree, because right now the th the interesting thing about Zen is that my experience is that the main thing that kills the Zen in a lot of cases is the McCree. Like Zenyatta has to still be running for his life even with his new survivability because the way Zen's hitboxes are, he's pretty easy to hit relative to a lot of other characters in his weight class. So it's pretty easy for McCree to come around and either two or three shot him. So it it's weird. Even though Zen has gotten these huge buffs and he's getting played more, he's actually being kept in check by the new meta. It's weird, but he's definitely, I would agree that in general, yeah. love his changes have been for the better. And I think probably the least complained about character of the recently buffed. I thought it was interesting because a lot of the pro players, I think were most afraid of the Zen changes. Like when yeah. a lot of these changes went on the PTR before they actually got to play them. And now that like the meta is starting to coalesce around them, you know, like you said, they're finding there's less to complain about with him than they thought. But I do agree that without the McCree change, maybe there, there might be an issue there which, you know, we'll have to see, like, as the meta develops, because I, I don't think we're still settled yet with, you know, this cast of characters that we have right now. But I think that we're definitely going to see some triple support teams with, like, Zen, Lucio, and probably Anna sometimes, which which will be interesting because of the damage output you have there. And I do think that Discord probably is a little too OP, and I think it may make sense to make it more in line with, with Mercy 30% damage boost or something like that. Um, some people would want them whole mechanic removed, but... We're also seeing a ton of Zen because of the Divas. And Zen has been always very good against Diva. So it all kind of fits in together of having these mirrored comps now of Divas and Zens. And oh, that's just fantastic. Um, but I think that Zen is still. I think I like the Zen change the most of all of them, have the least well, complaints. The other thing that does too, and that it also helps Rain and Roadhog a little bit. Roadhog, I mean, as people that have played with Roadhog, I tilt get me probably. Started, CP. Uh, do, uh, look, uh, you, you can say don't, don't get you start. started. I tilt harder than you do when it comes to Roadhog, okay? I, I, when I get I hit know. by the bus-sized hook, I, my gameplay decision-making starts going out the window because it just... I mean, Roadhog gets in my head, but it's also, it's part he's in my head, and part I'm getting hooked through a floor, through a wall, because, you know, a, the bus part of the hook barely hit my shoulder. It's just like, oh, my you guys, goodness. You guys are just doing it wrong. Like, you should be playing Roadhog. You should be playing d <laughs> you know? Like, come on. But at the very least, the Zen buff yes. does make it a little bit less great to play Roadhog, because if you have a Discord orb on you as Roadhog and people are attacking you, you are not only dying really quickly, but you're feeding a whole ton of vaults. So there's that makes it so you won't see Roadhog. There's a lot of, I think Roadhog, Roadhog is a little interesting, like after the, the meta shifts or with this patch, because I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons not to play him now where, you know, like you, like you said with Zenyatta, but I think there's also reasons to play him because I think he's a, he's a good heal target for Anna. Like if you give him the healing buff, um, he's got a lot of health. So her like burst healing kind of is effective with him. And I think the Roadhoggle might be one of the only ways you might be able to consistently counter nano boost on certain heroes where they're kind of unstoppable without something like that. Um, so we haven't really talked much about Anna yet. And obviously that's yeah. like another major change. Yeah. And I think teams are still kind of feeling her out, but you know, Anna, we're going to have to wait and see. So Anna is weird. I feel like the base view on her in pubs is that she has not been very impressive in pubs where, again, generally speaking, a Mercy or Lucio is offering you a lot more in overall team healing and just presence that people are comfortable with. The sleep dart seems very difficult to get value of, but this is all changes in the comp scene where there's a lot of more real setups for Ana. It's just, I don't know what to expect. I just hope it's not one of those cases where people look at Ana and go, well, she would be in theory really effective, but it's so much easier and reliable to run you know, Lucille Mercy or something like that, that we're just not going to run on it. We'll, we'll have to see. And Zen now, and Zen now yeah, is like but, definitely way in the meta more than Ana. I'm yeah. on the fence really right now. I played Ana a bunch because I'm a support main. So I have maybe five or six hours um, on Ana and PTR and, and in comp play, I've been yelled at by a bunch of pro players to <laughs> not play Ana in comp play, which tells me either they think I suck, which is, very possible uh, or be that just not the right decision to make and that uh, and that mercy and zen are way better decisions especially and, and Koth lucio is still the right way to play so that i'm really not sure where it's going to be going i think on offense we'd probably see her way more than on defense it's still risky to run widow on defense um even when widow was was in the meta way more than offense so i think mm -hmm. anna will have a similar 
type of reasoning reasoning there. I think she, I mean, of course, uh, we talk about the sleep dart, uh, and her alt is kind of insanity. Like, that cannot yes. be the, like, really, if you're using Ana, you're, we're talking, I want to talk about the E, which I think might be the best part about her, which is still the, the most underexplored reasoning for using her, but the ultimate combined with Genji's ult or with Reinhardt without doing anything or with Soldier's ult, there are a few combos which have the ability really to wipe the whole team in seconds without any possibility of killing that character, which I think is cool. I get what they're trying to do. Other part of me thinks like, did, did Anna ult really need damage resist and damage buff and um maybe one th one thing with the old two is really that really need it did it like it, yeah okay well, it actually up. charges very fast that's another thing yes. with the old like if you're a good player and you hit your shots like you can charge that ult super fast you can probably charge it faster than like mercy the defender's ult. ults and then even mercy ult no yeah. and ult is so, is old school mercy ult level so i think on, on offense i think you'll definitely see a lot of use for that because she can get her ult up and give you that ult advantage like in the first first fight with ults basically like before the defending team has them ready so i think so that, that'll be a powerful tool i'm sorry <laughs> yeah, yeah so sorry. i was gonna say one thing i'd say about ana alt more so than anything else is that bear in mind support alts are the most powerful class of alts in the game in a lot of ways in the sense that they sort of dictate what teams can and cannot do in fights so for Ana alt to be really good and be on the same class as resurrection sound bear here and then, of course, uh, you know, we were going to see Transcends a little bit more. It needed to be a little bit on the ridiculous side. Maybe it was overtuned, but on the same note, just remember the world destroying ults it's up against. When a team uses Sound Barrier, if you don't have a really well coordinated disengage, you are screwed. You are going to die. If a team gets a four person res off with Mercy, you're probably doomed in most cases. So for Ana ult, it needed to be an ult that had sort of a similar level of power. So I don't necessarily begrudge what it oh, has right, right now. And, but we'll see if it's too much. I'm I'm not sure. I mean, but sound barrier is like one of the longest ults to charge. Mercy res, yes. like getting the four man res off is difficult. Like it's not that easy to do and, that. And even in, in some reses, you could just you could just immediately die after. You right. can let the other team if you, yeah. if you're resing in bad positioning, you could their team can feed alt off you. So that part I'm not sure. I don't know. You're just like go crazy. You're like here you go, man. You're invincible. I if you have a sick Genji on your oh, team, no. and if you have soldier alt. Uh, things can oh, get insane. Dude, no, and no, 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 no. kind of just crazy. Dude, the it's, the Sanic or the Sanic uh, combination of Soldier plus Ana is just he's moving around at mock speed. And if he has his own ult, he's doing so much damage. That ult combination is just silly. That's uh, thank you. It brought back a little bit of uh, PTSD there. But yeah, <laughs> no, there's definitely potential for Ana in those regards. I just uh, note this for the, her kit is that I feel like you have to have a very specific game plan for using it. And also, in general, I'm reserving judgment until we see more comp matches with her played. But Sleep Dar is one of those things that, in theory, seems super, super awesome, but in practice has not been very impressive. I mean, compared to Sleep Dart to Discord, I feel like everyone, if you could take Honest Kit and just replace Sleep Dart with her having Discord, would anyone take Sleep Dart over Discord right now? Yeah, Discord is like one of the most overpowered abilities it, in the game. I know, like, I know, period. I'm just noting. But, I mean... but that's what it's competing against <laughs> when you pick Ana. Like, Ana is competing against your Zen pick. Well, I will say that the... I don't e think so. You play both of them. Like, you, you play uh, yeah, 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 sure. with Ana and you could Zen. play both. Yeah. There you go. Uh, but Ana's E is really, really good. Probably the yeah. best part about her, and I think it's the most underexplored, and teams don't exactly know how to use the best, whether it's for self-team healing or to deny enemy healing. And I think that one is going to take the most time to to get used to. I mean, I think uh, that you, know, you brought up that she's useful on offense. I think even on defense, she can... I mean, she, I think she has good, decent counter engage if your team can execute right against certain comps because of the power of that that ability, where if you toss it into the middle of a battle and you hit your teammates and the enemy team, you're basically just going to win it, right? Like... Mm -hmm. Plus, plus you can land a sleep dart. So I think that there's there's potential there that I think it will take teams a while to figure out how to, to really make that work. But I think that it will work at the highest level um, once teams, you know, have enough practice with it. But it may take a while before we're, we're at that point. I mean, there's a lot of talk about triple support meta and how much, how effective that will be. Uh, I am It's still interesting because I've heard pro play, like a lot of pros say Anna 
blows and that's not going to be a thing a lot of yeah. people think that, that it's going to yeah. be overpowered like i've heard both sides from you know top top teams so i don't know it's it's pretty it's pretty interesting to see like what what will come out of the I think teams that especially have a great Genji on them, I think that's the character that comes the most to mind of the DPS characters that can go kind of ham. I mean, yeah, you can put it on Creed, you can go like one shot everything, kill things, and Soldier, especially with the ult, is the best usage. But Genji has the potential, even with him and just his normal ult, of wiping the whole team. And now it's just like craziness to try to, to deal with that. Uh, Reinhardt is the other one which I think has the most effect, um, especially with speed boost. It's really hard. You can't get away from it, and you're just going to totally die to it. So I think probably the teams that have some individual skilled players are the ones that are going to be more willing to to test that out, especially Genji's. The other interesting dynamic I think that it brings is like, if you're playing those triple supports, like who is playing, like what what classes? Even if you're running Anna and double support combinations, I think it's going to cause like a lot of a shifts in some of these teams. I mean, I think it's going to be most successful for teams that have support players that were previously FPS DPS players in other games, or that had transferred over from DPS to support based on the roster. So someone like Grego on Cloud9 or Harry Hook in Ships of Jin on Envious, I think are great examples. Grego, of course, coming from Counter-Strike. We've seen him on Weto a whole lot during the, the Zero Hero Limit uh, metas. So I think that will fit him quite nicely. Um, and then, you know, I think that will probably be, we'll see someone like Toxican, who's been moved from DPS to support. I think both those type of people are probably going to have the most fun because they've had to be playing Lucio for like every day for the last like five months straight. They've had to play Lucio. You always need a Lucio. Sometimes they went single support with the Mercy. Well, you still probably always need the Lucio, stuff. right? I mean, that's that's the other issue. You still probably always need the Lucio. So you can just switch your Mercy to Lucio and then have your Lucio like go Anna or, or Zen if they're more talented aiming. I mean, I, mean, I, I will also say yeah. for the majority of teams, the Lucio player is the one that has generally the better DPS experience and that is has the more ability to flex. I think like Rogue is a good example of Unko as the Mercy players flexing into DPS, which has actually worked pretty well. But for a majority of the other teams, it's been the Lucio players. So I think there's going to be actually some adjustment if they want to keep Lucio and they want to have the Mercy flex into Anna, they better step step it up in terms of practicing, you know, their aim. It, it is and isn't with the Lucio's flexing because there was a really long period of time where just because of Lucio's importance to the game that you would never switch off Lucio, period. The Lucio player, I mean, I think back to um, Harry Hook. Uh, of course, he used to go by Nabridge and and all the rest. But there's a point where I think he was on Lucio and nothing but for literally three to four months. And yeah, it has switched up a little bit as of late, where now, of course, you see Harry Hook coming in on 76 at times where Lucio isn't being run and all the rest. But uh, I don't know. I'm not necessarily disagreeing. We have seen more dynamicism come out of your Lucio players when compared to, say, your pure Mercy players, which you know, tend to be more support heavy. But uh, it's I mean, only think, really been recently yeah. that you've seen the switch ups. It definitely depends on like what personnel you have. I know like I think like Cloud9 and Reunited are doing it differently. I interviewed Grego and Cruz about what what they're gonna play. And, like Grego was obviously excited about the Anna, and Adam was basically like, "Well, I'll switch to Lucio. It's more of like a traditional support type hero, even if there is like a deathmatch component. So that doesn't make sense." But you know, like Cruz is like, "Well, I'm really good on Lucio, and I've played Lucio the most, so I should just keep playing it because I'm amazing," you know. And it's like, well, so I think I think it's you know it's gonna be a case by case basis, but it's also gonna get complicated when you add in triple supports. Like, who's gonna play Zen? Who's gonna play Anna? Yep. Like it's it's gonna be really interesting because in a lot of these cases it's like um, some of these people you might have to actually have people play like the same hero both two different people depending on what lineup you want to run, which makes it difficult to kind of coordinate you know how you're gonna play take it, it adds an, an extra element to like what you're gonna practice. I mean nothing well, has made speed boost not the best ability in the game still like yeah, that's still yeah. the best ability in the entirety of Overwatch. And now because we are playing Stopwatch again and because King of the Hill is still a thing, we'll probably have more King of the Hill maps, it's just really going to be hard to ever remove Lucio from being one of the supports in the meta. That The single support stuff on payload, especially for the first point attacking to get to capture the payload on either mm -hmm. defense or offense, will probably still stay. But that's really, I think, one of the only options. 
most of the time. So the one big thing we haven't talked about here today, uh, moving along to the last item on the list, of course, uh, the biggest news in Overwatch Esports, uh, E-League uh, coming out of Qualifier starting tomorrow. So uh, very short notice on it, but uh, $300,000 prize pool. E-League, of course, a huge name in Esports. Again, what they're done in CS and all the rest. And it's here. <laughs> it sort of came out of nowhere, but it's here. It's going to be on television. Yeah, I think I think Rod, you were one that was saying it would take years for Overwatch to, to be on TV a while back, and you're wrong. So this is huge <laughs> news for for the game. I think it's I think it's first. I think it's great for competitive Overwatch. Uh, TBS and Turner I think have done a very good job with the Counter Strike League season one. Maybe there are some hiccups from the SK LG issues in terms of. You know, having that team in, of course, there's been some growing pains that way. But I think overall, they've actually done a pretty fantastic job of putting Counter-Strike on television and showcasing it for new viewers and having some of the best productions so far of any of the events and doing a good job promotion and the marketing. So, like, all of the, all of the stuff that they've proven they could do for Counter-Strike leads me to believe they will do as good for Overwatch. And partnering with Faceit which has shown themselves to be pretty competent in Counter-Strike. They have roots coming from Quake as the first game they ever supported um, as the events they were doing. So they have Deathmatch roots. Sermi is part of the organization over there, and he's probably part of the reason they're, they're doing this, that he's been playing a lot of Overwatch, um, former you know professional gamer in Painkiller uh, and in Quake. So I think that they definitely have not just the mainstream part of it, but they have some of the roots to really show that they – know what they're doing some people like ddk i see played overwatch quite a lot and i think he would probably he's probably a pretty good fit for what they're doing so overall and the and on top of it they have three hundred dollars three hundred thousand dollars which is more prize money than any other league we talked about previously on, on the show where i'm annoyed about watching all these online tournaments which don't matter anymore because they all run together and now e-league is going to come in and kill all of them in one big announcement and all, all the other leagues are, nothing else matters now like e-league has made their announcement 300 grand, and I don't care about pretty much every other tournament that's going to be happening, even if I cast them or talk about them. <laughs> they, really, they, they really have no comparison now to the big dog, and I actually I mean, like that. I mean, Gamescom 100K, you know, something, right? Yeah. That, that, that's, still, yeah. that's still okay. It's a LAN. But. Yeah, Gamescom <laughs> is still important, but yeah, I mean, now the weekend stuff, I mean, especially if it's going to be every weekend, uh, they'll have to, it's going to be a shift to other events that have been going on the scene, things like, for example, yeah. the weeklies that have been going on. I don't know what the signups are going to be, but I'm not sure. It might be an admin disaster tomorrow for the Ghost of Gamer side of things, because frankly, you just got cross-scheduled by, you know, <laughs> E-League. There's nothing you can do about that. That's just, that's it. It is now the biggest thing. It's on weekends. Uh, we'll see how things develop. It's sort of one of those things where you woke up, uh, looked at it, like, oh, so this is happening. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, obviously, uh, different tournaments in the scene are going to shift. I think also it's not just the weeklies that uh, have issues. Uh, the BTS Cup was supposed to be uh, continuing this weekend, uh, was it not? Am I crazy? Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe so. Are th they're an invite tournament, and if everyone's playing the qualifiers, I don't. What does that mean for the BTS Cup as well? I mean, at least for the weeklies, that's a weekly thing. It's a thing, you know, you make things with sponsors over the course of a month, right? Well, the BTS Cup, you have invite teams. You're locked into invite teams. I don't even know how that affects them tomorrow. That just seems, uh, I don't yeah, know. The logistics of this was weird when they announced yeah. a day before they were going to have qualifiers, which is kind of unheard of in a lot of ways. But it's like, well, they can do that because it's E-League. They're going to be on TV. They got 300K. So... I mean, teams are just going to fit in their schedule no matter what, which kind of sucks in some ways, but it's also like, well, whatever, you know? Like, we well, need we need someone that's going to raise the bar, basically. And that's one of the things I'm most excited about is is actually pushing the envelope of broadcast because we've seen so many online tournaments, weekly events and stuff. I mean, obviously, you guys do a great job when you're on the cast, but it's like there's a limit to what you can do with, you know, like yeah. one cameraman, oh. you're, you know, have a green screen at your home or whatever. Like this is gonna really gonna raise the bar for like what we can expect from Overwatch, I, and I, I think E League is is a great option to do that for all the reasons that Rod said before. 
Yeah, the camera stuff, I'm curious to see what they have planned for that and how that evolves. I'm sure it's going to be one of those things where 300K, there's no way Blizzard isn't involved on some level, right? Like, they have to be really advised and saying, look, present things like this, and, you know, let's not mess it up. So I'm sure if the qualifier goes down this weekend and there's issues on any level with the presentation that they're going to be fixed very, very shortly. So this weekend is sort of going to be the first run for them, but any issues, I would expect them to be very, very well, quick at fixing. I mean, there is an issue there where it's like, so Faces is the one that's running in the online qualifiers for the bulk of the event. So that's going to be a different production than what E-League does when yeah. the final event okay. happens in September and they bring... I'm not sure how many teams are going to go to the studio, but they're going to bring teams to the studio and think, put the event on television. I think it's just the grand finals. Uh, let me double yeah, check. Yeah, I was, I was reading the grand finals. Okay, so it's yeah. just the grand finals that's going to be there because that's actually the one thing that people in esports tend to forget is that you think about how things are done in real sporting events. Real sporting events, unless it's a Super Bowl now, which has just gotten extremely delayed over time, but your average game is not lasting eight hours. It's not an eight-hour event. You have a block of time where for three, four hours, you have this live sporting event, and that's it. You end early by you know, Twitch standards or all the rest, where you on Twitch, you have any sort of event or even some of the weekend events that go on. They're on all day long. It's a 14 hour stream. When you deal with real TV, real TV has different expectations where just look, we're going to be running one game or, you know, one set. That's what's going to be. And that's that's final. It's a, and they're OK with putting all the production stuff into it because they have entire ecosystems designed around doing that on a regular basis. Now, Sam, you said earlier, you talked about how this is a big opportunity for E-League and Turner to kind of showcase Overwatch, especially because of the production. And as I've mentioned several times, I think that now from casting and playing Overwatch quite a lot, that I am pretty sure this is this might be one of the hardest games in all of esports to broadcast. Like the top, maybe top three, probably the number one hardest game yeah. in all of esports to broadcast. You have... The problems of FPS games, of having 10, now 12 different first-person views, of having to capture all of their first-person views while not missing the kills and the action, and then add on top of that uh, 22 characters with insane abilities, and they all colors are flying across the freaking screen, and all this shit is happening. There's constant skirmishes and fighting all the time that you have definitely put together, and as we've seen, the hardest game to broadcast. So knowing that and knowing that, you know, all the great production that they've done for Counter-Strike, Sam, you mentioned earlier that I said that uh, I didn't think it was ready for TV. I don't think it's ready for TV. I actually think that this is kind of a mistake. I don't understand why. I mean, okay, look, there could be a few things. Maybe Blizzard made the deal now with E-League because E-League wanted to put it together for their advertising package together with Counter-Strike and sell a bigger sponsorship. Maybe Blizzard wanted to get this going because Blizzard wants to pump up the PR marketing machine of Overwatch Esports and get everything going. Maybe they and Turner struck a deal and they could only do it on these TV dates because Turner was locked into other commitments for other things. Those are all possibilities and reasons why it needed to go now. But we're talking about broadcasting the game on television and having people understand what the fuck is happening. No, we are not even remotely close to being uh, anywhere near doing this successfully. We don't have observer tools through the right way. We don't have demos. We barely have really the ability to showcase different angles and be able to get from player to player to really showcase their kills or what they're doing in, uh, in the game. And I can see no way that this is going to go smoothly on television i do not think it's ready it's gonna be difficult too because they're just broadcasting the one thing and like what is e league gonna have produced in overwatch before that like they're not gonna have that much experience with whatever crew they have in theory i mean I don't, I don't know what they're you know planning to do for the broadcast so that that is that is definitely a worry but i mean i think that they'll have tools available to them that other broadcasts so far have not like they'll be able to have maybe f multiple spectator cameras that they'll have a, a director who can you know swap views from there, so the, the camera switching is more smooth and you know has better direction, which obviously is still going to be extremely difficult in Overwatch. But, I mean, I think there's, I don't know, there's a lot of issues there to parse. Obviously, like, Blizzard needs to give better tools out. I know that they've been working on them. They've mocked things up. I don't know how far along they are. I mean, I feel like some of the things we've seen recently kind of point that Blizzard has been angling towards this E-League as kind of like the start of their 
Overwatch esports look because I, I think that some of the things like the one hero limit coming into play, it was kind of odd that they made that decision after, you know, three days after they were tweeting out, a, you know, like hero class stacking is a core element of Overwatch and teamwork is key. You know, like, and then like four days later, they're like, oh, one hero limit in competitive play. And I think things like that might be, you know, leading, leading into this. So I think that they're going to be prepared. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we'll see like the time bank and payload. So that makes the scoring system for that more watchable um, by the time the broadcast is out. But obviously there's still a lot more issues that, you know, are just going to be hard to tackle. And I think it's going to take a lot of experience and effort to get over them in broadcasting. Also, I think that um, they need to remove control maps from the game for broadcasting purposes because they're terrible. It's just a cluster. It's just a clusterfuck everywhere. Like nothing's going on. There's like no visual teamwork you can see. You're just spectating random viewpoints. You're like, oh, he just got a kill there, kill there, kill there. It's, it's awful. Like I think the payload is the best mode for spectating right now because the payload object itself gives like a focal point to the storytelling of the story of a match. But yeah, that's a whole other issue that I, you know, I don't think Blizzard will cave on yet. Well, so spectator mode. <laughs> spectator mode, I probably have more time in spectator than anyone else. Like I'm pretty firmly confident that I have more time in spectator in Overwatch in terms of watching actual matches and having to make it presentable to people than probably anyone else in the game. And I have a lot of theories on how to improve things and all the rest. There's a few key things that you would want in uh, sooner rather than later. I mean, the biggest thing is that you mentioned here, missing action, all the rest, right? And even if you have multiple observers working on a event, you're not going to have that. I feel like some sort of time lapse would be really, really vital because then you could do things that people ask a little bit more, things like viewing, say, other roles, tank supports, et cetera, if you knew that you would always be able to switch or get alerted when a DPS gets, like, the big three kill, kill and all the rest. And even then, when you focus more heavily on DPS, you still have points where you miss, say, the Widowmaker picking off three people because, well, Widow isn't that much in the meta right now. She doesn't explode that much, but there's times where you'll still have that happen, but you don't want to stand the Widow the entire time. And that's just, like, one of many things. There's a lot of different things that the UI could be giving you to sort of explain what's going on. And certainly, I think... Uh, actually, there's two really big things on top of the delay that I think really should be added. One is that you definitely need some sort of mini map in the spectator UI, period, full stop. Please. Just yeah. to give people a better sense of what's going on, especially when you're in someone's first person view. Overhead cam, I mean, can be dicey at best at points and still takes away from first person camping. A good mini map would do wonders. And then number two is that I understand why the main game does not do a whole lot on stats, right? I understand why you're not giving people a scoreboard so you can see, you know, really name and shame the, you know, level 57 tracer on your team that really isn't doing anything. Like, I get that. But for a competitive, real format here, normal traditional sports are defined and, e and, see, and, and seen yep. by the stats. Yes, people love the numbers. They like knowing who's on fire. They like knowing who's playing like shit. And they like knowing just all the general trivia st stats that go among it. So you want to spare people's feelings in the normal game? Sure. But the Observer client in particular really should have a fully functional scoreboard that sh tells the tale puts people on blast if need be, and reveres people if need be, because it's a slasher. There's so many times I've done casts with you where you have a moment where we're going, if you go, well, gee, if there's a scoreboard right now, this team would be goose-egging the other team. They would have nothing. And it's like, <laughs> yes, but we can't show the scoreboard showing the domination because there is no scoreboard to show. And that sucks. There needs to be a scoreboard. I mean, this is kind of pathetic that we're having to ask for a fucking scoreboard in the first person shooter game, which has been part of every traditional competitive FPS in history, it's it is mind boggling, what boggling. Like I understand the reasoning to reduce toxicity, which I will say has not worked. And I totally nope. disagree with that thinking, <laughs> and which is completely wrong on Blizzard. And even that part of why they did it is actually wrong, and they are wrong on this decision. But even for the pro games and for the and for at us as casters and as journalists and as analysts to talk about the game, we don't have information to use. And to have to like 
fight Blizzard on this and to have to do this show and talk about how we need the numbers of like kills and deaths and like objective time and like all this stuff to see like a list of all the players at the end of the game and you're able to click into all their profiles and to see what happened and everything and for all the spectators at home to see what happened in the game we should not ha be having to do this because it is such a, a thing that needs to be there by default uh, that it, it is really frustrating. And especially, as you mentioned, if we could have that, it would help us tell the story of the yeah. tournament and of the team and of the players instead of saying, well, they got this all early in the game and here's a play of the match and they got this big thing and we can highlight things that happened in the <laughs> game. And of course, you know, that affected really why, why things happen. But numbers are there for a reason to help showcase and to help us you know, show the people why such a thing happened and what the outcome was. And I can't believe that it's still, we're still post-release, the game is out, the game is ready, we're launched, we have a new character, we don't have fucking scoreboards? Come on. Yeah, yeah the scoreboards, the other thing too is that, you know, we, there's times where we uh, sort of, we really do uh, talk up players where we go, wow, Tailspin and Tavik are just going off, they're being crazy and all the rest, where we say that, you know, say the you know talk about another story let's see nine where reaver hasn't been doing quite as well as he was in the past uh under the last meta it would be really cool if we could go and be like well look here's a scoreboard average for reaver in the previous patch and here's a scoreboard average now he is now averaging 300 less fire per game whereas you look at the sure four has been taking more of the load he's actually getting 150 more fire per minute per game or whatever but it's not enough and you actually look at like there's a lot of really cool things there's you could so do cool things with you the could scoreboard do. yeah exactly and you can measure like how much damage players. you do on a genji ult or something like that like compare different players between that like there's so many different amazing things you could do like with the stats they're already like being tracked in the game basically it's just that they're not available which is one of the things that makes it so frustrating right like you just can't get them, even though they're there. You know they're there. You know they have this information on their back end, but it's just not facing you. It's horrible. And really, the people that get the hurt the most are the viewers, because we as analysts and casters can't do our job to the best of our ability because we can't use the tools that would help us to, to do that. And then the viewers can't make judgment calls for themselves, where even though I would say probably for people at home, seeing like the the end scores for counter-strike and the kills and deaths never truly shows what happened in the match and a lot of fans take just the kd ratio or their, or their per at the end to determine like oh that player played like shit because he had a negative 15 net even though he was like the in-game leader and made a bunch of clutch plays and you know what et cetera et cetera but to not even give the the fans out there the ability to make those like to have that thinking themselves is a shame and it doesn't make the game it doesn't help overwatch as a competitive esport to prove itself alongside other games it only hurts it and makes it look more casual and makes it look like it's not deserving to be a professional esport so i don't think blizzard's decision making on making it less toxic has worked i don't think i don't actually agree that it has worked and i don't think and it's severely hampered the professional aspect uh, of it i mean i feel I, like I a lot of I don't their know about Go ahead, Sam. Sorry. I, I was just saying, I feel like a lot of their, like, decision-making in terms of development with regards to, like, the pro scene and competitive play mode just haven't actually been from, like, a competitive angle, even though, like, it's in the name of, like, the game mode in terms of, like, things like we had the coin flip sudden death and things like that. Like, I feel like Blizzard needs to update their mindset for this when, you know, they are. They're pushing this as an eSport on television. Like, they're, they're doing all of these things. Like, they want the game to be competitive in an eSport. Competitive play is you know, like the primary game mode in their game right now, but they, they're not like treating it as such, basically. I think that really needs to change soon. But I hope that, you know, some of the feedback they've had on some of these features, like the general player base hasn't, hasn't liked some of that stuff. So I think that we're starting to see a shift towards that maybe. And, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll see some changes soon. Yeah, but one can help. But I think uh, we've covered pretty much everything about E-League. Do anyone have any final uh, words, thoughts, et cetera, on that before we sort of uh, close out the show, uh, say our final thoughts on anything from today and all the rest? Well, I'm just kind of wondering what you guys, how you guys feel about the television aspect, because that's kind of been like 
a bugaboo of esports for 20 years. You know, I remember like Angel Munoz, like in 1997, you know, trying to get like CPL is going to be on MTV and, you know, it's going to be that that's going to take us to the next level. I mean, obviously, like we're at a different stage in the development where we have our own distribution platforms with like Twitch and things like that, which have obviously been very successful. But E League is, you know, having some level of success with, with Counter Counter Strike and their show. So is this is this kind of like the next step? Like, what does this really mean? Is this is this a good place for Overwatch to go? I think in general, I'm not too worried about any sort of backlash. I mean, I think in general, it's it is the next step. I mean, you have to make your forays into the medium period, and it's one of those things where. People who know it will be really appreciative. It will draw in new people. You'll get a reaction from people saying, oh, geez, why is this on TV? But uh, other things got that as well. Like when poker first came on TV, the first reaction was, oh, my God, why is poker on TV? I I think in general, I mean, so long as it's not a total disaster in the, you know, the way it's done or whatnot, even if certain things aren't perfect, I can't help but feel like it's a step forward. I mean, we'll see. I don't know how, what could the negatives that could happen there where maybe it gets like horribly negatively rated. But I'd have to think for this sort of thing that they're not on the rating side of things. They're not expecting huge, huge ratings. I, I don't know. It's not something I have yeah, that I mean, I've heard all sorts of rumblings about like the E-League ratings and whether like Turner's happy or displeased with them. And it's like, I don't know, you know, who knows? I mean, I think that is true where it doesn't matter on some levels, like what the viewership is. But I think this is kind of like a launching pad where if it does succeed, yeah. like it's going to kind of explode a little bit. Well, esports on television, I think, just in general, for this past year, I think it's actually gone pretty well. Uh, I think Turner knew going in the numbers were not going to be great. I mean, I don't. I'm all. I've also heard some things about how their. I mean, I know their official response has been, "Well, we know that it's going to take a while, and we're committed to season two, and yada yada." <laughs> uh, but the numbers did go down quite a bit after the debut uh launch day for the cs league and they have been growing actually since steadily since then but it hasn't been super high um and then evo on espn i actually think did pretty well uh viewership wise see like the the games on the tele on television have actually gone really well like the production for counter strike and evo being on espn and like what that means for the larger fighting game community and for the larger entirety of esports that has all been great like, Counter-Strike being on TV has helped. Uh, Evo being on ESPN has helped. Like, that whole aspect has been really good. The viewership... The dorm. The, the, oh, yeah. T- I, I <laughs> forgot. So that's actually my worry. Because the viewership, for even though that Evo and fighting games, I truly believe, are the very best esport for television, and then realistic first-person shooters are second in line, which is Counter-Strike, which is really good for television. And even those two... While they are the testing grounds for viewership, and it's probably only going to get better, like you can't expect these these leagues and these games to do like incredible viewership, like coming out of the gate on on debut platforms. Maybe a little bit less than expected. And Heroes of the Dorm did not do well at all. Now, Heroes I mean, of the Dorm was a college tournament, and it wasn't like a big international championship, and no one was kidding about the players. The player yeah, 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 yeah. So like all that, to- like I totally get, but. Do I really think that Overwatch is going to get good viewership uh, for the finals of E-League? No. Like, it doesn't matter who plays. Also- it could be Cloud9 versus Envy, or Cloud9 versus Envy, or Cloud9 versus Rogue, or whatever, big TSN, whatever it is, right? And it's not going to do well. And I think the production side would be cool. I think the, uh, everyone, look, Overwatch is on television, and Blizzard's going to promote the shit out of it, and the community's going to go fucking hide me. <laughs> Overwatch. Oh my god, it's fucking great! But <laughs> no one's really gonna watch on Turner, and it doesn't make sense for television. As we talk about the spectator tools, that's one part of it. Watching a deathmatch FPS game is not easy at all. Like watching Dota or League on television is hard. So you're 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 complexing the, the all the MOBA elements of like spells and. Sh- fucking colors flying around the screen and all this crazy shit and then you're adding on like 12 POVs and there's just no way that this is going to be like attracting the mainstream viewer other than like oh I saw Tracer and Widowmaker's ass a bunch lately for Overwatch I know those memes I know I'm going to watch this like that that I think is the only way they're going to get in some of the mainstream users 
I mean, it is kind of weird because it's like Overwatch's esports itself is not exactly established in terms of like having no, a, not at all. A, stru a structure for, you know, long term growth, long term leagues. Like, there's there's nothing there. Like, we've just had a bunch of online stuff that has gotten great viewership on Twitch for all being online stuff. But, you know, there's, there's nothing else. So it's like if this is the first thing and, you know, putting it on television does seem kind of risky in a lot of ways, I feel. Did we lose ZP? Did we lose ZP? We lost ZP. He's dead. I think so. Yeah, I think ZP died. He rage quit. Yeah. He rage quit when you were dissing, dissing Heroes of the Storm, you know, his game. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Instantly made his <laughs> connection go down. I mean, I just like, you know, Overwatch as an eSport still is barely talked about, like, on the main subreddit. It still... Yeah doesn't have a main competitive mode. We're still talking about, like, maps. We're still talking about spectator features. And then you jumpstart it all the way into TV. Like, how did we go? Counter-Strike Go had been going through, like, at least two years of momentum and majors coming out of Valve and, like, uh, all the third-party events in the world competing against each other of who could put on the better Counter-Strike event and who could have the better talent and who could have the better format and the better matches and teams. And Overwatch has none of that besides maybe a few orgs here and there doing online tournaments. There hasn't been a LAN yet, a real international LAN. ESL is going to be the first LAN. And then you're on, now you're going like all the way into into TV, uh, which I think will be cool. It's going to be cool. It just won't be successful on viewership-wise. It's also probably too early and kind of unnecessary at this time, but it's only going to be good, and there's no downside, really, to any of this. Oh, yeah, I mean, in some, in some uh, ways, so it's I, like... I was going to say, I've returned. Uh, I missed a little bit of that. My PC just randomly decided to freeze. I, I guess I just wanted to say on all the rest there is that I think what people have to understand is that it's going to be a building thing where... You, you need to get into the market at some point. I mean, even going all the way back in the day, I'll tell you this much. You look at the history of things like American football. American football on TV was not anywhere near... It sort of took a while for people to warm up to it. I think esports in general, it's going to be the same thing where it's going to take a while. But the reason why companies like Turner are taking the risk and are investing heavily in all this is that there's huge rewards to be reaped. I mean, I think some of the early nights of E-League, I was just pulling up some stats to look at uh, while Rob was talking about there. There's points where E-League got more viewers than competing NHL games. And you might go, oh, gee, they're just beating the NHL. Well, the NHL has a whole lot of money behind it and a whole lot of... Uh, it, you know, industry and everything else that go to make it a thing. So if from a tourist perspective, if they can take a small investment now and turn it into something that's bigger than, say, the NHL or otherwise, like the lower end traditional sports, that's huge, especially as advertisers look more and more for live events to fill TV because – Say you run a really popular TV show, there's no saying that your ads are going to reach anyone because people just DVR crap into oblivion. That's kind of the point I made in the uh, the article I wrote today about the announcement was that like if if you know this succeeds very well for E League and they're able to you know like Rod said earlier get a much larger deal for you know ensuing content with Overwatch, maybe they could become like the show in Overwatch. They could be running Blizzard's League for for them basically. We could see. You know something massive come out of that so i think it is a calculated risk for them because in counter-strike like e-league is big but it's not like the thing there's still the four majors that they're competing with that are still kind of you know the, the, the biggest events around um so i think this is you know a good opportunity for e-league to to try and make something work and i think that if it doesn't succeed it's not the end of the world for overwatch esports or anything like that like i think there's still there's way too much momentum for it to really have a huge impact. Well, I think a big thing for Turner for the Counter-Strike League has been the online viewership. I think that'll do great. I think mm -hmm. E-League is now immediately going to dominate the team's attention, which is the most important part as we've seen esports grow bigger. Whichever league can get the top teams is going to have the most viewers. So because E-League is coming in with three times the prize pool of the previous event, which is which was four times the prize pool of the other event, which was <laughs> which, that was like five times. Yeah, so... The, the mon monumentum, the X times the prize pool for this event has made it that this will be the de facto league. So the online viewership should actually do really well, I think. Uh, I so, think we're going to see what the broadcasters are and such. But I know Blizzard is not 
I know Blizzard is not in the uh, business of throwing away money for nothing, right? Like, no businesses or all the rest. But if you think about all the money that Overwatch has generated, something like, I think someone mentioned that the loot boxes alone, like, made $300 million in the first month. Um, you BlizzCon is still a thing that's coming in after the finals of E-League. Like, BlizzCon is in November. And November is still a fair ways away from September. Who We talk about the ever-increasing prize pools. I mean, BlizzCon could easily, however it's set up, which would probably have to be invite only at this point. I can't see them doing any sort of like short notice for the BlizzCon. It would be invite. But What, for BlizzCon? Yeah, yeah for BlizzCon. I don't like, think I, invite. You don't think BlizzCon, is, uh, BlizzCon will be invite? Because no. you look at all the events mm. that are going on. You think that they're going to be running some sort of road to BlizzCon in between the ESL stuff and the E-League stuff? I... I, I mean, you wanted to do something, you'd have regional qualifiers. Like, it wouldn't be that, wouldn't be that big of a deal. Like, I, I just said. wonder how... I just wonder the timeline and how scrunch it's all going to get. But I guess the main thing, the only point I was going to make here is that we have 300k for E-League. Blizzard has certainly gotten a lot of money from Overwatch. If they want to reinvest part back in, you could see a $500,000 tournament or more come into play at BlizzCon. So, I mean, for the teams involved... There's no way been... BlizzCon would be less than a million dollars. Like, you, you think a it, you... after what they've done for the previous games, they're like, no it way. It needs to be at least a million dollars. It's going to be at least a million. 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 You, you think it would be at least a million? Okay. I, I'm just... I'm predicting lower. Just be... Uh, they spent like get... five million on Here's the Storm this year, right? Like... Yeah. They sent it's statues like... <laughs> to three different countries, and who knows how that much costs? <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, okay. Gotta okay, yeah. be at least a mill. Gotta be at least a mill. It's not always that simple on corporate politics, but you're right. It could, I would hope it's at least a million. I'm just no. I'm just you know, tempering expectations, saying all right, you know, we have 100k Gamescom, 300k E League, maybe 500k BlizzCon, but yeah, okay. I I hope it's a million. I'm just tempering expectations, I guess. I I don't know. I mean, this also could showcase maybe they're testing the waters. Maybe maybe BlizzCon gets aired on on Turner. Blizzard also has a close relationship with ESPN. Maybe Overwatch is aired on ESPN. So I think it's actually probably a good test for the game to see how well or not it gets reception on TV. Maybe that also to see what kind of business deals they want to they wanna go forward. It should be exciting. I mean, I wish I had cable to watch it, you know, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all in all... Uh, really, this is a pretty sick week for Overwatch, yeah. head of Overwatch and yeah. Overwatch Esports. As much as I think there's like a ton of issues all around, like uh, as a whole, you have every major team organization pretty much getting in. There's still several more that want to pick up teams. There's not enough talent or players to pick up really for the amount of organizations that, that want to get in right now. You have the E-League announcement and ESL is going pretty smoothly so far. So I think that competitive Overwatch as a whole is in a very, very good state right now. Yeah. All things considered. It's an incredibly strong state as it's going forward. I mean, you look at the progress it's making, assuming that things catch on in popularity, things keep going up. The actual game itself is still well handled. I mean, you're looking at something. I don't know where the actual height of it is, but certainly it seems like at the very least, it might be able to get up and compete with the Counter-Strikes of the world and certainly the Dotas of the world. League, I... I League is a weird case where it feels like it's part catching up to League, part seeing if League continues tripping over its own shoelaces, but I guess we'll have to see. I mean, in terms of, like, the amount of copies of the game they sold, like, they're in the range of League of Legends' like, daily active player base of all of those people who bought Overwatch are playing regularly, right? I mean, why do we run into the same there, but... people in high uh, rankings <laughs> every single day? If there's 7 We're... million people playing, why am I running into the same 60 level 65 bastion who will only pick 6. it? 6.5 million game? of those people have just been playing League of Legends for like the past five years. Yeah. And they can't like click on things on their screen with, with accuracy, Rod. This isn't a, like buffing your ego type thing or, you know, doing it by association and all the rest. But you do look at it is ranking ranked right now is a normal distribution. If you are in the 70s, you're already in the like top 1%. And don't forget, not everyone plays ranked. There's only a small subset of people that play ranked. So like I would guess, and this is completely out of my ass as I guess this, but I would guess that it's probably 25% or fewer of people that have Overwatch that regularly play ranked. So already you're cutting the player base by a quarter. And then you take a look at the ranked where if you're in the 70s, which you are, Rod, that's going to be the top like 0.1%. Rip 80. Yeah, it's, it's really... 
Uh, like you're dealing with a very, very small subset there. I mean, your average player, the average is supposed to be 50. You're not even dealing with all the people that are between ranks 25 to 50. And the, I, I don't know. It's just, it's easy to think that's a small world when you're at the top. But right now, Rod, you are at the top as far as um, ranking all this stuff. Probably not a good probably sign. Probably not a very good <laughs> sign. Or maybe you should just go <laughs> for, for, for any right future now. hopes against Korea. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> hey, we got further than FaZe, technically, in the qualifier. So, I'm oh, my pro contract, everyone. MMR Assassin. Coming near you. <laughs> oh, man. But I, I think that uh, with that, I think we have hit pretty much everything we uh, want to talk to about here today. Anyone have any final things that they have not said before uh, we wrap it up and call the show? Because we've been going for over two hours now, which... You know, again, no one had anywhere else to go, but uh, Sam? Uh, I'm just happy for my boy Harbaloo. Uh, you know, I took him to his first land championship in like 2010 at ESCA, and you know, now he's grown up. He's pro player on the biggest esports organization in North America, so nice job to him. He, he deserves it. He's worked hard. He's He actually said he just put in his two weeks notice because he's actually been working full time while competing, and now this has given him the opportunity to to go full time Overwatch, so maybe more good things from the uh, the former Code Seven boys. All right, uh, Rod. For me, it's going to be I think E League is starting as we've mentioned tomorrow, and I am re looking forward to watching these games. Um, see what the meta comes. We're going to be watching all of you. We're actually watching this. We're watching a lot of Zenyatta. A lot of Diva, a lot of Sign from me, and a lot of McCree. Just imagine there was zero hero limit right now. We'd have double McCree, double Diva, probably double Zen all the time. And I'd want to just, just oh. make it stop. Make it stop. But I'm so what? glad that's not there. We're still going to yeah, have that. But it's easy to forget about since sermon's running for a while now the real game has it but oh my goodness if without one hero on it it would always be high noon right now and with that i think that is a good stopping point here uh i'm zp that was opled and slasher join us for was it really long show man. here oh, oh man oh plaid i oh plaid oh plaid oh plaid man mm -hmm. one of these days CP, didn't you cast him when he was competing and winning? Yes. Shouldn't you know this by now? Hmm? I do. I, honestly, I think casting wise, we had, came up with like 10 different pronunciations of his name in hey, the you same said cast. Piero. Piero for yep. like a <laughs> month now. No one corrected me. I was like, okay, well, whatever. And then finally, Giffy was like, you know, it's Pyro, right? It's like, okay. Now, now, now I know. I mean, this is just esports names, but. Either way, it was a good show here tonight, uh, today. We caught up with a lot of things. It was long, but it was a momentous week in Overwatch. We had a lot to talk about. But hopefully you guys will catch us here next week. But until next time, we'll see you guys then.